Going to, um, we're going to start. Um, I noticed there's about 75 people continues to climb towards 80 on the call. We had, uh, we had about eight, 150 that have registered, but um, we are sort of on the, on the clock. And I know that um, a lot of folks have things to do later on. So we'd like to try and stick to the agenda and the times that we have. Uh, good morning and thank you all for, um, uh, for being on, on this, um, attending our Spring Into Action uh, today. My name is Sean McKinney and I'm the president of the Ottawa District Labor Council. Um, we're going to start first with the land acknowledgement and I'll go to uh, Terry McKay. Uh, Terry is an elder from the Eagle Clan of the Gitando tribe of the Samashian Nation. Um, again, for the uh, for the land acknowledgement, Terry, you're up. Thank you muted, Terry. Cool. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm very, very glad to be here. Um, the first thing is that I'm um, from the West Coast, so this is not my territory. So I have to um, use my responsibility and uh, um, acknowledge the traditional holders of the land. It, this land is uh, belongs to the Algonquin people. Now, I've been asked to speak about land acknowledgement, but um, and I've, I've thought about this for quite a while. And then, um, you know, there are over 640 villages across Canada. And um, the, I've, I've seen land acknowledgement for the Algonquin people. And I've seen one of them. And that's two pages long. That's, that's, that, that's a lot of uh, uh, information. If you, if you, if you uh, uh, put it all across Canada. So, um, I don't know a lot about the Algonquin people. Um, so I, w I want to start by uh, um, uh, letting you know about our land acknowledgement on, on the West Coast. Um, our people were canoe travelers. Yeah, we, we traveled up and down the coast right from Alaska, right down to California. And some people even said we went to uh, Hawaii. So um, we knew where our territory was. Okay? And we knew when we stepped into somebody else's territory, uh, we had to acknowledge them somehow. And the way we did it was to... Um, uh, make a payment of some kind, okay? And then the nations up and down the coast, every, every one of them did that. So <clears throat> over here in this area, it, it's pretty well, the, the, uh, the basics are pretty well the same. They, um, they know where their territory is. They know where somebody else lives and uh, uh, who live, who uh, governs that area. And um, if they want to uh, enter the territory of somebody else, they will. I've heard that they will camp out on the outskirts of the territory and light a fire, and that will. That will draw the attention of the people who would, you know, like the Algonquins. If the uh, Ojibwe wanted to come into Algonquin territories and they would light a fire, then the uh, scouting party would come up and uh, 
ask them their intentions and if they're, they're good intentions, sure, we'll let them in. So, <clears throat> um, that that's my knowledge of uh, of uh, land acknowledgement, and um, I've been here about in Ottawa for about forty years. So, my most profound acknowledgement to them is that I've learned their customs, traditions, and. Uh, um, if there's something that I do in ceremony or, or you know, uh, something that I do at home, um, I ask an elder. I ask them if this is uh, appropriate or not. To give you an example, like uh, um, out west, we use uh, uh, cedar down in ceremonies. And they, they are used to, uh, um, we sprinkle them around the dance floor. Okay. Over here, that's not allowed. You cannot let, let an eagle feather touch the ground. So that kind of, that kind of thing, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I feel it's important, uh, I will ask uh, somebody there, um, what, what shall I do? And if they say no, fine, then I won't do it. It's it's uh, it's respectful, you know. And uh, um, we have to show respect, and uh, uh, we don't just come in and barge in and say, "Well, we we got to do this way, do it this way or that way," because uh, this is the way we are done. Things were done at home. So, anyhow, that's my uh, uh, bit about land acknowledgement. So, um, the Algonquins also, they use um, uh, this time to uh, say a prayer because we have to, uh, uh, there are certain uh, things that we ask for, and, and we do that in prayer. So, I'd like to say a prayer now. So, and when I when I say a prayer, I say Creator, and uh, I also mean uh, God, Buddha, Allah, whatever deity you uh, worship. So, Creator, we thank you for bringing us together to another day. We thank you for bringing us together. Today we ask to send us wisdom and knowledge and patience and love and sharing and caring of our ancestors as we talk about things which will affect our lives as well as others. And that whatever is said, we ask that uh, we listen to the words and then try to understand them. And if they are good, we can pass them on to the younger generation to make mothers a better place to live. Creator, we ask to give us a good day today. All my relations, thank you. Thank you very much. Gary, thank you. And um, uh, my apologies, sir, if I'm if I'm saying something that I ought not to say, but I think it's important. I think it's relevant for the people that are attending this, uh, this important health and safety conference to bring up the simple fact that you are also a residential school survivor. So thank you again, Terry. And I'm going to try and see you over at your place later on this afternoon. So thanks again, Terry. Thank you. Hope You're muted, Sean. Um, I was muted. Did you hear any of what I said? I, I heard what you said about um, uh, Terry. And then after you, Terry left, you got muted. Okay, so okay, so I'll just um, um, you know, I just I, that really frustrates, right? You're on <laughs> mute. You're on mute for two years, man. Um, okay, so uh, for the last um, several years, the local advisory committee of OCAL and the Ottawa District Labor Council has worked very closely together, um, including on this specific event. 
um, which we call Spring Into Action. I know, notice there's 85 people on the call now, and I suspect people will be coming on and um, maybe some will come on specifically for some presentations and then they'll have to go, certainly realizing that everybody is really busy. Um, we do have a local advisory committee in, the, in Ottawa, uh, chaired by Laura Lazansky. Uh, Leanne Feltham is, um, is the vice chair. She's also with EDFO. Uh, Kim Minette is a Workers' Health Safety Center representative. She is the recording secretary. Mark Ballon from the PSAC is a member of the advisory committee. Richard LeBlanc from the Steelworkers, uh, member of the committee. Olivier Melanson, a uh, young worker rep uh, from CUPE. Uh, Debbie Scrivens, uh, former Workers' Health and Safety Center rep, uh, now a community rep on the committee. Aaron Smith from CUPE, uh, who's a WSIB uh, officer with CUPE. Um, is on the committee, Bed Treadwicker from the Redford Labor Council, Lisa Gifford from the Leeds Grenville Labor Council, Mackenzie Debuch, uh, Indigenous Cancer Program with the Ottawa Hospital, is a member of the committee, Papa Hayes from OPSU, uh, over at Algonquin College is, uh, is a member of the committee, Cheryl Baker um, um, does a lot of work uh, uh, for the committee, uh, she's a client service coordinator with OCAO, and certainly all the uh, uh, wonderful OCAL staff and Jennifer Moore, um, who's done a, a significant amount of work putting this together. Um, there's no, um, uh, yeah, so, and Kimberly O'Connell, I should mention as well. So just to um, uh, identify members of the local advisory committee here in, in Ottawa and Eastern Ontario region. And with that note, I'm gonna hand it over to, um, co-facilitator, co-chair, um, the chair of the local advisory committee of OCAL, Laura Lazansky. Laura? Thank you, Sean. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 um, Spring Into Action. Uh, we're excited uh, about our speakers today and hope that the program is, uh, is beneficial to you to apply in your workplace or uh, research or anything uh, else that you may be um, uh, able to apply it to. So uh, as Sean said, I am the chair of the local advisory committee uh, and uh, uh, OCAL along with the Ottawa and District Labor Council have co-hosted um, these spring into actions for a few years now. And um, we're really, uh, again, excited. Um, we'd like to take an opportunity to uh, introduce David Chesey. Uh, he's president of OCAL provincially and chair of OCAL's board of directors. David's played a pivotal role in ensuring that OCAL, its clinic staff, and LACs are engaged and supported to carry out their very important work on behalf of workers and their workplaces here in Ontario. And so I invite David to say a few words, please. And after David uh, speaks, I will um, do a bit of housekeeping. Thank you. David? Thanks, Laura. And thank you to both uh, Sean and yourself on behalf of the Ottawa District Labor Council and the local advisory committee of OCAL. As Laura mentioned, I am the president and chair of the board of OCAL provincially. Um, it's a privilege to, to be in this seat. I get to participate in a lot of, almost all of the events of OCAL, this being one of them, but uh, it also holds a special place in my heart when I see that local advisory committees take on different projects. And you can see that by today's agenda, uh, this committee worked very diligently and very hard to put together uh, a really qualified and energetic group of speakers to give you a good morning of information. So sit back, relax, enjoy, uh, take, take a few notes, but uh, most importantly, take the information that you learn here today, take it back with you and share it broadly. Wherever you come from, whether you're an employer rep, worker rep, whether you're an interested party or just a person from the general public who's uh, attending today. So I wanna express my thanks again to the Labor Council in Ottawa. I wanna thank the local advisory committee of OCAL. I wanna thank Kimberly and all her staff in the Ottawa clinic, uh, Cheryl included, who puts a lot of time into getting these events together and helps the committee put them together. I also wanna thank all of the presenters who are going to be on today for taking the time out today to, to share your knowledge and your wisdom. You've got some really qualified and dedicated people that are going to present today. So uh, I know that there'll be some opportunity for question and answers. Don't, don't be afraid to ask the questions. 
um, that's important so that you get the knowledge out of the session that, that you came to get. And I also want to thank all of you, the participants who've decided to join us today, uh, because as Sean mentioned at the beginning, we are very busy people, but to take time out, it means that there's something of interest to you today that you're you're joining us for. And lastly, I guess I just want to say on behalf of the, the board of directors, thank you. Uh, we put on many different what we call webinars uh, throughout the province for various times of the year. You, you've probably just come through the February uh, RSI, Repetitive Strain Injury Plus Day seminars. You have probably joined us on all of our Friday seminars that we offer regularly. Uh, we're going into what we call our May Day, May Day um, seminars in May. So there's never a shortage of knowledge sharing. And especially if you don't get to see the presentations live, what I do encourage you to do is to visit our website. It's pretty simple. It's ohcow.on.ca. Uh, perhaps that can go up in the chat at some point. And a lot of our webinars that we put on throughout the year are housed on our website. So you can always go back and you can relook, re-listen, uh, and relearn. And one last little thing, um, you heard me and you heard Laura talk about local advisory committee. The provincial board of directors is looking at all our catchment areas to what we'll call local outreach committees. And that will happen usually uh, throughout the rest of this year and probably be confirmed at our AGM, our annual general meeting in September. And I encourage you to, if you're interested, speak to Laura. She's always willing to take on new members and focus on the keyword today. That's the outreach. And I also want to thank all of the seven labor councils around the Ottawa catchment area or our Eastern Ontario clinic catchment area for participating because that's part of the outreach is spreading. We have a large urban sprawl for our clinic. We have a large catchment area. We can't do it alone. So thanks everybody and enjoy. Thank you, David. Uh, so I just want to take a minute or two to do a bit of uh, housekeeping. So Zoom, if you're having any issues or questions, please contact Jennifer through the chat. It'll go directly to her. Uh, please note that the uh, session is being recorded. If you're having any bandwidth issues, please feel free to turn your screen off. You will be muted during the presentations, and then the mute will be turned it off, turned off for questions. Um, the chat will also um, be open. It's turned off for you right now. The chat will open five minutes prior to the end of the speaker's presentations for questions in the chat. Uh, you will also have the option to put your virtual hand up. And uh, Cheryl Baker from OCAL will be monitoring uh, the speakers and will alternate between uh, what's in the chat uh, and the uh, virtual hand. Um, so, and I'll be monitoring the time as we go and reminding the speakers uh, when they have about two minutes um, before their uh, presentations end. Uh, importantly, you should have received a link more than once now for the post-session evaluation. Please take the time to fill it out because this helps us plan um, our annual uh, event. So we'll, what, whatever you put into those feedback forms uh, will help us plan for our 2024 spring into action. And it's very, very important to us. So please do that. There will be a break at 10.15. Um, to 10.30, so we will break at 10.15, and then if you could please be back promptly at 10.30, because we will have uh, another guest speaker uh, starting, or and uh, we we would uh, like to make sure that everybody is uh, settled and and uh, uh, ready to go. So I'd, I'd like now to introduce Kimberly O'Connell, 
the executive director of our Eastern Region OCAL Clinic. Uh, Kimberly brings uh, valuable knowledge, guidance, and expertise to our LAC, and she brings a lot of energy and support. She helps keep us focused and always looking for creative ways to help the clinic support the Eastern Region uh, catchment area. And we are very, very uh, fortunate to have Kimberly as our executive director and, uh, and of course, the wonderful staff that, that work with her. So Kimberly, if you would please uh, say a few words. And uh, Kimberly will also be introducing our first two guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and uh, you heard earlier about this wonderful LIC. Uh, I, I just can't say enough about how, um, how blessed we are in this region and so glad to have you all today. Uh, it, it's kind of, it showcases really the strength um, of this uh, the, the the support in the eastern region and we really wanted to, to kind of highlight that and OCAL is transitioning um, and I think uh, as Sean alluded to there's so many frustrations over this virtual world that we had been in and, and then entering back uh, as we are into the reality um, and the benefits and um, also uh, struggles that have come uh, after and after all of that or during or whatever you want to call it. But some of it is, so we're kind of expanding to have you served um, across the board uh, of OCAL, but also having this really strong regional approach. And I just have to shout out before I introduce the speakers to the Ottawa team and Tracy Peener Snow, our occupational health nurse who, uh, you know, we're so excited to share with you Leonore and Eduardo's presentation because, uh, you know, we had tried to get this amazing uh, migrant farm worker and temporary foreign worker program going in the East. And it was really, uh, despite a lot of efforts, uh, you know, a real barrier, we barrier after barrier. And I just have to shout out to the folks uh, in the East that were working on that for, for years and it's really exciting to share with you some progress here. Um, um, and Cheryl Baker, of course, um, we'll thank at the end, but uh, uh, being strongly involved in the East, Kevin, you're gonna hear from, which is excellent. Um, and uh, Todd Eirich, also a hygienist in the Eastern team. Um, and then you'll see a, a bunch of folks from OCAL with us participating today um, that have been involved in this program. Um, and. Uh, in the indoor air quality that uh, Kevin's about to speak to. So I can't name everyone, but uh, I am just so grateful to be working with both the LACs the, uh, and the, the staff at OCAL providing you uh, services. Uh, so without further ado, I will um, introduce our speakers for this morning. The first, um, Eduardo Huesca has worked with uh, migrant and temporary foreign workers across Ontario for over 15 years. Uh, with particular experience with the migrant agricultural workers. He's a project manager with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers and currently manages Oak House two migrant worker projects, including Oak House federally funded TNOWSS project, which focuses on work with temporary foreign workers in Eastern Ottawa region. Eduardo has presented OHS informal informational workshops to over 2000 migrant agricultural workers across Ontario including topics such as health and safety rights, heat stress and sun safety, eye health, safety, pesticide, and ergonomic hazards, among others. Eduardo has worked to improve the accessibility of OHS information for these workers, and through ongoing consultation, he contributes to identifying and responding to key areas of needed OHS attention. Eduardo recognizes that significant barriers need to be addressed and ensure migrant workers are healthy and safe at work, and are able to report unsafe conditions and receive support if they experience workplace injury or illness. Uh, joining him is our uh, Leonor Cedillo, uh, which started her career as an activist for workers' occupational health and safety rights in one of the first NGOs in Mexico, and only one working, the only one working with unions, uh, applying to the Italian union approach to participatory research and organizing and the use of risk mapping. Her professional career has centered on policy work and applied research on topics related to both environmental and occupational health. Her studies were international with a bachelor's degree in biology from UNAM Mexico, a master's in occupational health from the Institute of the Occupational Medicine in Cuba, and a doctorate in work environment sciences from the University of Massachusetts. In addition to the OHS research in, on, in topics related to chemicals and pesticide exposures in the early detection of their health effects in the policy field, she led 
the work for the first substances inventory in Mexico, ILO country assessment of occupational safety and health in Mexico and the Dominican Republic, analysis of factors in the occupational health of non-agricultural temporary foreign workers, and the policy implications of research projects under the Canadian On the Move Partnership. Recent projects with international unions include her involvement in multi-country projects for ITUC on the care economy and for ITF on the mental health of young workers in public transportation during COVID. She also conducted research for the ITF on the mental health of ground staff and cabin crew based on literature review. She was a research associate with the Canada Chair of Occupational Health and Safety Law at Ottawa U, short-term senior officer for environment and occupational safety at CUPE and is occupational health specialist now at OCAO since 2020, where we're lucky to have her, where she's been involved in activities related to the qualitative component of stress surveys and co-leading role in the project for mental health and psychosocial supports for international agricultural workers in Ontario. She's coordinating the Ottawa area component of the migrant worker support project, which you're about to hear much more of from both. So welcome. Great, thank you so much. So I'll just share my, my uh, presentation and then get started. Um, and thank you so much for having us. I'm, I'm as mentioned, I'm Eduardo Huesca. Um, and I just wanted to quickly apologize that some of my slides are not are a little bit messier than I'd like, but we're in the midst of reporting across our, our project. So um, it's been a bit of hectic time, but luckily I have my colleague, Leonor Sadio that I know is gonna make me look at through her work always does. So uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, just to get started, I, I think most people uh, know oh, how it sounds, you know, this, uh, this network that has been created, is, you know, sounds amazing, but just as a quick reminder, we're a network of occupational health clinics uh, dispersed across the province. Our mission is to protect workers and their communities from occupational disease, injuries and illnesses, and support their capacity to address occupational hazards and promote the social, mental and, and physical well-being. Of, of them and their families. Um, so we're staffed by a multidisciplinary teams uh, across each clinic, um, as, as you've heard of and are presenting today. Um, so uh, yes, so I'm, and so I've, I've worked out of our um, Hamilton clinic um, and uh, that tends to have a lot of catchment within the migrant worker um, field, but, uh, but yes, so um, it's great to be collaborating across our clinics too. So I just like to start with this picture. Um, this is one of the first groups of uh, um, workers coming um, under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program in Canada. Um, these gentlemen were uh, coming from Jamaica, and this is in Niagara region um, around 1967, I believe. Um, and so this is really important because, you know, the history of these programs is a long one um, since 1966. And, you know, these workers definitely don't get the recognition that they deserve through just, uh, you know, the history of coming to sustain, um, you know, Canadian agriculture for, for as long as they have. You know, this this work is emotional. Um, you know, we see cases, we see stories, um, as I'm sure a lot of um, others have in, in your work with, with other communities. But definitely, um, you know, I can say uh, very confidently that, you know, temporary foreign workers continue to really um, not receive the, the, um, the support and attention they they, you know, that are needed uh, in terms of ensuring their safety and health at work. And it really challenges us to think about health and safety in uh, creative ways and ways that strategize to outreach to get to communities, um, you know, not relying on on um, strategies that that uh, have worked maybe in the past, but uh, we really, um, you know, yeah, are are challenged to to make this work better for 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 these for these workers. Um, so, in terms of temporary foreign workers in Canada, uh, the Ca Canadian Temporary Foreign Worker Program allows employers to hire workers um, from other countries under temporary foreign worker status uh, to address their labor needs. So, of course, this is pretty loaded in, in the sense we could, you know, talk about this for a while of why, you know, why um, people with permanent residency status uh, or citizenship are not working particular jobs. Um, often, it's the conditions, it's the health and safety uh, concerns associated with with employment. Um, so. Uh, to fill these gaps, uh, this program allows uh, employers um, to hire um, from abroad. Uh, these workers are provided employer-specific or tied work permits for a period of time, so their work permits expire. Um, there has been more opportunities for workers to um, move around among employers that are approved employers. However, this continues to be quite inaccessible to the majority of workers. Um, renewals and reapplications alongside limited and inaccessible pathways uh, for most for permanent residency does result in situations of workers being permanently temporary 
or you know having come to work for 25 years but uh, never accessing um, immigration uh, through uh, processes to to be to, to be able to stay or bring their families um, to Canada. Um, in terms of some of the stats, uh, you know the the highest number of temporary foreign workers coming through this program have been in agriculture. Um, so looking around at 50,000 to 60,000 um, employed every year in in agriculture and Canadian agriculture. Um, and uh, so, if, for example, in 2021, we saw 61,735 temporary foreign workers come in, which was an increase. Um, and in Ontario, we see the largest um, component or, or um, in terms of 43.2% of all um, temporary foreign workers coming into agriculture. And the greenhouse industry in Ontario sees a, sees a quite large share of this. Uh, however, and, and this kind of is relevant to our work in the East, um, you know, temporary foreign workers are, are coming into other industries as well. Uh, we've seen numbers and as well as announcements of increases in the allowance of employers to hire percentages of, uh, of their workforce to be um, temporary foreign workers. This has included in, in accommodation services and uh, food services as well. Um, in terms of, of, you know, the recognizing the need for an occupational health outreach program or projects, um, you know, these are, uh, these are industries or employment situations uh, that are considered high hazard. Um, so sometimes we talk about the three three D jobs: sturdy, dangerous, demanding. You know, I've also heard difficult and demeaning um, thrown in there as well. It's definitely the case of of what we tend to see. Um, and uh, you know, thinking about social determinants of occupational in injury and illness. You know, these workers experience poverty. Uh, they have uh, quite limited opportunities in their home countries um, that motivates them to come. They, they here they you know face food insecurity at times um, when hours are reduced um, sporadically by employers. Uh, housing issues, as as you know, a lot of people have heard, COVID shone, shone a light at, at a lot of um, issues with worker housing. The precarious nature of employment and the you know recognized fear of jeopardizing their opportunity to be here in Canada to work, so it really um, results in reluctance to report unsafe work conditions, practices, as well as injury or illnesses. We've met so many workers who you know are working with injuries um, uh, and just um, you know are not wanting to report to WSIB um, for fear that you know they won't be asked back uh, or they will be sent home the same the same uh, a season and we've we've documented and been part of cases uh, that, that have seen those those occurrences uh, they have limited access to healthcare so this has been uh, increasingly uh, uh, improving in some regions, but not all. Uh, so we've met workers who have been here multiple years without um, seeing any type of healthcare um, to, to really um, even start looking at, at some of their experiences. And just a, you know, a lack of uh, familiarity around health and safety or where to access health and safety information and support, and generally the health and safety system being slow or unresponsive to the needs of these workers. So um, you know, reporting lines being inaccessible to workers, uh, just a system in terms of uh, less proactive inspections in a lot of these sectors, um, depending on workers to then report when again, this uh, fear for, for jeopardizing the work uh, comes into play. Um, another concept that uh, is useful from a health and safety lens uh, to think about um, migrant or temporary foreign workers is is the the idea of a vulnerable worker um so again here we we don't talk about an inherent vulnerability of a worker more systematic um you know processes and structures that render them at a higher level of risk for occupational injury or illness so our partners at the institute for work and health have have done a lot of work around vulnerable workers and and workplace vulnerability and they, you know, they talk about vulnerability across area, uh, you know, four areas. So hazard exposure, workplace policies and procedures, workers' awareness of hazards and their rights and responsibilities, and their empowerment to participate in, in injury and illness prevention. So, you know, in terms of this matrix and and a measure tool that they've actually uh, developed, you know, the most vulnerable work workers would be those um, <clears throat> who are exposed to hazards in a combination with having inadequate workplace policies and procedures and low awareness of, of uh, or of, of the rights and of um, hazard prevention information and then you know working in workplaces that discourage their participation in injury and illness prevention and you know when i read this definition i just you know right away felt that this was you know the experience of temporary foreign workers uh to a, to a t in in quite a lot of uh of of the way 
Um, so just really uh, talking about our past work in other e uh, regions to kind of um, present a bit of, uh, you know, our work now that's uh, directing towards the east. Um, you know, right away, since starting in 2006 with colleagues, including Michelle Tu, occupational health nurse in Hamilton, Marie Lawrence, a hygienist uh, in Hamilton clinics as well, we started, you know, reaching out at the community level uh, to temporary foreign workers, uh, agriculture workers in the main agricultural regions of, of Ontario, mostly Simcoe, Norfolk County, Niagara, uh, Niagara region, Bradford as well. We, we went to Durham as well. Um, Durham was kind of the easternmost point uh, before really going uh, more east uh, when our program started uh, expanding a bit. Um, so this is a bit of the map of, again, the, you know, the regions with the highest number of, of workers. Uh, we also look west all the way to, you know, the greenhouse uh, uh, sectors of, of Windsor-Essex, Sarnia-Lampton, and Chatham-Kent as well. Um, and so our program really took us traveling across the province. In terms of uh, initially some of our work, we um, really started off with our parachute occupational health clinics. So this would be where we would pull our clinical staff, including our occupational health uh, uh, doctors and nurses, and we would find a community or a community space uh, accessible to migrant workers. We would. Uh, um, inform workers a couple weeks, uh, you know, usually a week before the clinic, um, and then we would uh, land in the community and have an open clinic, uh, no health card required, with interpretation support uh, reflecting the language needs of the workers. Um, we talk about prioritizing occupational health concerns, but we ended up seeing a bit of everything as well, because in a lot of these cases, uh, this could be the first encounter with a, a medical uh, staff that these workers had. Um, and so these clinics were really important for us to, to get a sense of what were the occupational health um, issues affecting these workers um, and to really inform ourselves about their work experience um, through, you know, the clinic intake form um, that we did, uh, the forms that we've, we've done. And so it really was a learning opportunity for us and our team to figure out uh, where the priorities uh, were needed. Uh, they, these were very, very collaborative. Uh, we worked with uh, local unions, with churches, with uh, community groups uh, to host us, um, host these clinics. Um, so this is a bit of data that uh, that we um, uh, uh, were able to pull together from these clinics, from these seven years of these clinics. So as you see, MSD issues, musculoskeletal disorders, were, have always been number one. And even data right now from the community health centers that have specialized clinics for um, migrant agriculture workers, you know, really see this as well. Um, you know, repetitive strain injuries, um, you know, awkward postures um, and, and just injuries. Uh, from the work, right, makes sense in terms of the work that people are doing. Uh, we were, we saw a lot of dermal issues, eye issues, as I'm going to mention as well, and really a, a strong part of this was the the, the noting that that uh, through the assessment it was identified that a lot of these cases, uh, you know, 41.7 of the cases were directly work related, um, as well as 20.5 indirectly work related. So um, you know, really seeing the need uh, and and uh, the concerns um, happening at the, at, at the workplace level. So our, our, um, based on uh, those uh, you know, uh, issues that we were ad identified through our clinics, we really focused on resources, uh, getting information to workers in accessible ways. So we looked a lot to the US, uh, but also to um, some, some other local materials as well. But uh, you know, the, the big focus was to make um, resources accessible. The health and safety system for a long time, resources have not been accessible um, at various language uh, reflecting language needs or literacy levels. Um, so that was a big uh, a big focus of ours. And then just getting this information to, to workers. Um, we've also then done workshops, both at the community level as well as the workplace level. Um, and, uh, you know, the workplace level was definitely has always been more challenging than the community level. At the community level, we've, you know, been um, welcomed by, again, uh, you know, com uh, community groups, churches to to hold our our, um, our workshops. Um, and, uh, but we've always really focused on trying to get to the workplace uh, because, you know, being able to, to try to uh, look at what's happening at the workplace, what resources are there and provide recommendations to change, um, you know, uh, or, or address and control hazards um, is key, right? Um, we struggle with providing uh, workers information and recommendations at the worker level, um, recognizing again, you know, the, the vulnerability that they, they experience in speaking out um, and making their concerns known at the workplace level. So um, that's, you know, a challenge in terms of, of both spaces and our interventions. This is uh, one example. Uh, so again, we were seeing a lot of eye health and safety issues, a lot of pterygium or cadnosidad in Spanish, which is this growth from the eye, growing from the side of the eye to the center, caused by, you know, um, 
continuous exposure to UV from the sun, as well as constant irritation to the eye. Um, so it, it's, it feels like, a, you know, it's, it's uh, maybe not as a, you know, a serious risk condition, but it's definitely of, of a concern to these workers. You know, even recently when I do workshops, you know, I'm seeing, you know, six out of 10 workers, both from the Latinx countries, as well as the Caribbean countries will have some degree of this growth. Um, and so a lot of it is tends to be for the amount of time they've worked um, back home in in sun exposure and uh, irritation to the eye, but it's definitely, uh, they speak to then in agriculture here, a lot of dirt, dust going to their eye. Again, the sun, even the greenhouse workers talk about eye irritation. The peach workers talk about the fuzz of the peaches going into their eye as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was an issue we, we saw clinically. And then so we focused on uh, prevention education, talking to workers about exposure to sun, education about UV exposure, um, and, uh, and then provided we were able to, with funding to provide safety glasses um, and actually have workers look at various safety glasses, select which ones made the most sense for the work they're doing between clear lenses to dark to then uh, in the middle reflective. Um, so it was a combination through prevention education and the provision of safety glasses. We were very um, interested in how uh, interested workers were about eye drops and issues around eye dryness and irritation as well. So we ended up also talking to workers a lot about eye drops and trying to figure out which eye drops uh, were best. Um, and these were some materials that we also organized at, 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 uh, on these topics to try to make them very visual. Um, one quick uh, uh, part of this too that I just want to share is uh, the type of kind of workplace interventions that we were able to uh, participate in. So this is an example, um, a more positive example we've encountered. So on this farm, uh, you know, I, I provided a workshop around, I think it was on heat stress and sun safety in Niagara, um, in this Niagara orchard. And the workers ended up talking to me about these ladders uh, that they were concerned about, feeling that the ladders that they were using were quite rickety and uh, they felt like they were going to fall off of them. So they had not communicated this to their employer because they did not speak English and the employer did not speak Spanish. So that's another big issue that we encounter is, you know, how does health and safety actually occur at a workplace where there's no communication, let alone, um, you know, uh, emergency, uh, you know, in the need of an emergency, but in training and, you know, how that happens. So with me being there, I asked these workers if I could, you know, uh, inform the employer about their concerns with the ladders. They said, yes, it was a language barrier, but they were also reluctant to speak out. Um, it took a bit of time for me to, uh, you know, and, and even when I spoke to the employer, um, I still just said generally, I obviously didn't name any specific workers. There was a big enough group of workers for me to, for them to feel a bit safe in that sense. Um, this employer right away was quite concerned, replaced the ladders, uh, you know, uh, ended up uh, fixing some, buying others, and and uh, the workers were quite happy. So this is kind of, uh, you know, a low level example of just communication barrier being, uh, you know, being here um, at, at stake in, in terms of this, uh, this hazard. But in other situations, cases, we've seen um, they have not played out as night as as smoothly. Um, we've encountered situations where workers are, for example, to being told to stay on their knees, working on their knees through their entire, um, you know, eight hour shift, um, moving around knees and end up having a lot of knee problems versus trying to, you know, um, split up work positions and, and what have you. So it's complicated. Um, COVID definitely, uh, you know, introduced uh, quite, quite a a concern among us. So uh, this is just an example right in March of 2020 when the pandemic started, uh, you know, we were quite concerned. Um, you know, we read a lot of articles calling this, you know, the that, you know, that these workers were basically the tinder in the path of the wildfire that that is COVID-19 in terms of just their uh, the living conditions, uh, you know, overcrowded, um, you know, lack of uh, access to information, effective information, health and safety programming and farms being already either not effective or not in place um, in some situations. Uh, so we were really quite concerned. So this is just an example of, of some early day uh, work we did around COVID and temporary foreign workers. We wrote this report, sent it out everywhere, basically. And then the subsequent years, we were quite active in um, in working around getting information around COVID uh, to workers. Um, you know, we were some of the first and it's showing kind of the clinical side of, of our work as well. Um, we were some of, we were, I would say, one of the first organizations to talk to workers about vaccine information, look at vaccine hesitancy, uh, um, you know, misinformation um, in accessible worker languages and, and formats, as well as uh, talking about, you know, aerosol colleagues of, of OCAL have been leaders and talking about the aerosol transmission of, of COVID. And so taking that information and getting that to workers as well. Um, 
fast forward a little bit. So in 20, or sorry, back uh, to, uh, well, yeah, to the same timeline, sorry. Um, in 2020, the federal government announced funding, uh, recognizing just uh, the disaster um, that, uh, you know, COVID showed a lot of, of the conditions that have been, been in place for years for, for temporary foreign workers, but the government uh, identified uh, funding to, to provide to various, re, uh, various organizations um, around uh, supporting migrant uh, workers. So we were a recipient of uh, a grant project uh, grant through the organization Kairos Canada. Um, so this actually was, with this project funding, it was our first starting look at the Eastern region um, beyond Durham. And, and this was led, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned by Tracy Fre uh, Fre Freener Snow, the occupational health nurse in, at the Ocow, um Ottawa uh, Clinic. So we did some trips to Prince Edward County here, uh, Quinty, Belleville. Um, but uh, this grant last was from 2020 to 2022. And then this, uh, uh, grant uh, shifted. And this grant was also mirroring some uh, grant federal grant funding that had been um, provided in British Columbia a few years uh, prior. And so now in present day, uh, we have uh, received what is now the version of that same grant, but it's now being distributed uh, by three organizations across Ontario. One of them is a, a collaboration between Workforce Windsor-Essex and the Windsor-Essex Lim uh, Immigration Partnership. And that grant is our project, funds our project that looks at, it's called the Teamwork Project, and it looks at Windsor-Essex, Sarnia-Lambton, and Chatham-Kent. Our work there has not stopped since the uh, uh, receiving this grant because of the greenhouses just being a, a full year, you know, um, enterprises. Uh, so every other weekend we're, we're uh, presenting workshops to, you know, 40, 50, 100 uh, workers in the community level. Um, we're still trying to, to get to the work, um, to the, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, workplace level, but, uh, but yes. Um, and the other grant is that's and where uh, we're going to speak more to today um, is under our TNO um, a neighborhood organization. So uh, sorry, this is a grant federal grant through the neighborhood organization TNO. This is a settlement organization based in Toronto that received this grant to look at the rest of the province, basically. So with this grant, we've looked at we're still looking at central regions. So it's kind of our 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 um, you know bread and butter regions that we've we've worked with in the east uh, in in the past. But then now we're looking at eastern region, Belleville, Quinty, North Umberland, as well as the Ottawa region, as, as well as Thunder Bay. In the eastern region, and you know. This was uh, my part of this was planned and, and I kind of uh, this presentation um, snuck up on me, but we should have really um, included Dorothy Wigmore, who is doing uh, the coordination of our eastern region that looks at Belleville, Quinty and Northumberland. So in this in this uh, region, we've really looked at we've started to look at uh, meat packing as well as mushroom uh, production. Uh, we've hired some outreach workers that really have connections to workers working in these in these local um, sectors, um, and we're really rolling forward. Dorothy's done a lot of of uh, community capacity building and and meetings with uh, with local uh, community groups. Um, the Quinty Local Immigration Partnership has been a great partner, and through Dorothy's work and and uh, us pushing, they've uh, decided to develop uh, the first uh, migrant worker, temporary foreign worker working group out of their uh, QLIP uh, organization. So that's a uh, that's great. Um, and just quickly before I pass this um, to, to Leonor, um, you know, Dorothy has also led a lot of, of our work uh, looking at and, and kind of connected to the, the presentations that are following, looking at ventilation and air cleaning in worker housing um, and mentioning just, you know, the housing conditions have been, you know, just really bad for a long, long time um, in a lot of situations. Um, they, there was a federal, you know, consultation around this that that wasn't acted on quite a few years ago. That could have also prevented a lot of what happened during COVID as well with these workers. Um, so a lot of our work now has been focusing on building these CR CR box fan air filters um, for worker housing. Talking to workers about it, talking to workers about ventilation, um, as well as building these boxes with workers and as and also in community settings where who are of community groups how uh, hosting workers so we're seeing a lot of church masses start up again um, in this idea that you know everything's relaxed with COVID but we're there really speaking to people saying you know um, it's not and you know we can help you really make these spaces uh, a lot safer for um, you know as you still bring the community together and but but in we can help in, in doing it in safer ways and, and Dorothy's been definitely leading um, that work. Uh, we have some workshops in Simcoe planned in this in this area. So this is just kind of, um, you know, definitely uh, the crux of the work that we're really pulling towards the east. And then now I'll pass it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Leonor, who then will um, um, speak now to the to the actual work that has happened in, in Ottawa specifically. Thank you. 
Hello, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for having us uh, presenting here. It is very important and particularly because it is in, in Ottawa. And as I'm going to show you, we have a, a true challenges in starting up activities here with temporary foreign workers. Uh, the, the next one, please. So the project goals and the time frame for, for this is uh, to assist as many temporary foreign workers as possible in the categories of low wage and primary agriculture by providing one-on-one -on -one assistance as required, in informing workers about their rights and responsibilities, and offer training uh, to workers for identifying workplace hazards and the possible solutions through participatory format workshops and activities. Uh, also distributing and developing specific information tools, for example, uh, posters, pamphlets, wallet cards, etc., and promoting workers' linkages with the community where they work or live. Uh, we also need to learn from workers about their needs in occupational health and safety and, all, and evaluate how our resources fit with them or developing new ones. The time frame for this project is in, uh, from October 2022 to March 2024. Uh, the next one. So the first challenge that we have is to find the workers. Where are the temporary foreign workers uh, working in Ottawa? And here uh, our field is broader than in other areas in, in the, uh, that now we are also looking at occupations in other, uh, in, in other sectors, not only in agriculture. But uh, what happened is that we are not aware of researchers work, working with temporary foreign workers in Ottawa, not aware of uh, temporary foreign workers networks in Ottawa or the community health clinics with uh, running programs with temporary foreign workers in, in here and not even community groups or other organizations working uh, or able to work with temporary foreign workers here. So the next one, please. Uh, so we uh, developed some strategies to uh, overcome this uh, challenge. And one of them is asking <laughs> key informants about the activities that could be uh, uh, conduct, uh, conducting in, in Ottawa that we are not aware of, of suggestions from them about how to uh, start up the activities. So we emailed uh, 86 researchers in Canada who have production in temporary foreign worker topics. We also post a call through Facebook pages, uh, OCAU TFWs and other uh, web pages. And also the healthcare team that is uh, in, in this project working for the different regions uh, uh, to asking them to search also the, for the primary health clinics which have activities directed to temporary foreign workers in Ottawa. And we have started calling as well, 38 organizations that we have in our directory in Ottawa. The next one, please. So another strategy has been to search the secondary data sources. And mainly those have been the labor market impact assessment uh, that is uh, administered by ESDC. Uh, the work permits by IRCC, the agriculture census from 2021, and the job bank, uh, the, the job offers in job bank for temporary foreign workers. Uh, the next one, please. Then the secondary sources uh, review, for example, you could see here a panorama in Ontario from the uh, data that we got from the labor market impact assessment and the work permits. And, and you could see uh, that there is an unexpected mismatch because of the timing. Uh, so first, the labor market impact assessment is submitted for uh, acceptance and then 
after it is accepted that is calling in the in the data positive LMIAs, uh, uh, then it is the recruitment phase in many cases, and then is the work permit uh, asked. So we could see uh, this mismatch in the in the graphic, and the data are for all Ontario. The next one, please. So what we have, uh, what we have from Ottawa in Ottawa in 2021 for the whole year, we have uh, these numbers of temporary foreign worker positions in the positive L LMIAs. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, we have the mandate for this uh, project to focus only in low wage and primary agriculture. So in, in Ottawa, the temporary foreign worker positions were uh, in 2021, 229 uh, low wage positions and 559 on prim primary agriculture. From these 559, we know that 398 were of these positions were under the seasonal agricultural worker program, that it is an eight month program for workers that are coming every, every year at a maximum of eight months. But other, there are other workers in that, in that stream that are not from the seasonal agriculture. And those workers have a two year permit. So the next one, please. So this is this comes from the census of agriculture in the same year 2021, and we could see here there's a 68 that 68 farms report 410 paid agricultural workers in the category of seasonal or temporary workers. This 410 of course should be in, should include the 398 workers under the seasonal program and might be other foreign workers because here it is just these categories do not allow us to see a which of how many of them are temporary foreign workers then the next one please and now if we look at the temporary foreign workers uh, uh, in the low wage stream, it is possible to get also the, the data from the uh, labor market impact assessments. But uh, it is useful also to look at the job bank for uh, temporary foreign worker positions. But these are isolated searches that could see and any day, and here it is, it is one, just as an example, a, from December last year, in, you see in the a, a sector of personal services, that includes nail salons. And four out of these six a, positions were, nail sal were for nail salon technicians. Uh, the next one. Please. So the the this all this come from the uh, secondary sources, and then the third uh, our third strategy is to focus uh, activities to approach workplaces. So the first type of workplaces that we are uh, uh, trying to approach that we are approaching are the farms. So we built an inventory of employers, including those who got positive labor market assessments for positions of primary, agri primary agriculture during 2022. Uh, our inventory contains 59 farms. Uh, the uh, positions uh, that were on the, the LMIAs were 339, and we sent a letter in English and in French to 33 farms. Uh, those were the ones that we 
uh, were sure that are hiring temporary foreign workers and also that we were able to get their uh, email addresses because we are still working in getting others email addresses. So we mapped the maps and also started visiting the farms to introduce our occupational health and safety services. The next one, please. Here is a, a, a picture of the, of the map, the, the map we uh, built of farms. On the left, you could see all the farms in the, in the Ottawa region. And on the right, you could see what, what happened when you click one of, one of them. So the, uh, it shows then the information that we have about that, uh, that farm, including the temporary foreign worker positions that were approved for in 2022. The next one, please. So in this same strategy, a strategy uh, in which we focus activities to approach the workplaces, we started looking at nail salons. It was suggested uh, by uh, Kimberly, in fact, to contact uh, for, that we contact the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center in Toronto, because this center has been conducting already a 10 year uh, project to train workers and employers on the existing health and health hazard in these workplaces and also to improve the occupational health and safety nail salons in Toronto. So we contacted them to become familiar with the strategies for approaching these small businesses and uh, to know also what occupational uh, materials they have they, they have been developed. So we search also for other uh, projects conducted in Canada and in the US, including the legal protections that have been established in some of these cities, in some of the cities. Uh, so we created an inventory of links, groups, and educational materials relating to occupational health and safety nail salons identified and created a directory of the 110 nail salons that are currently active in Ottawa and created a map with all the, uh, sal the nail salons uh, to guide our field visits. We visited already five nail salons to introduce ourselves and the occupational health and safety support we could provide and distributed as well uh, of our educational materials on how to properly use respirators. Uh, so we need to uh, continue producing different uh, type of materials to address the uh, health hazards in these workplaces. So we, uh, we also presented the NAIL uh, Salon project to a um, group of master's students at the University of Toronto. So Eduardo presented it. And uh, they work in a proposal of, of potential evaluation tools for, for the project. Uh, the next slides show the mapping that we have done of the nail salons. So we have here on the left, all the nail salons in, in Ottawa and on the right, it, it, they are in, in purple, the ones that we already visited. So it is also a useful uh, tool for us to work uh, with. And we have been in, including in this one, the, uh, the nail salons that already got a assessment approvals for temporary foreign workers, as well as, as those that are requiring a workers through the job bank. The next one, please. Leonor, um, you have two minutes. It's Laura. Yes, thank you, Laura. I'm finishing. So then the, uh, the last strategy that, that I'm going to talk about is to that we are inviting workers to contact us directly through Facebook pages and also posting our invitation. You could see the posting that uh, we developed in English and in Spanish. 
uh, inviting workers to contact us directly, to contact Monique, who is working with us, Monique Lefebvre, who is working with us now as, a, uh, an, as an outreach worker. So we are posting this in several places now, and we welcome any suggestion for places uh, where we could uh, continue posting this invitation. And then the next one. So thank you very much for your attention and please consider collaborating with us in these efforts through suggestions or uh, whatever you want to uh, uh, contribute. And let us know if you have questions and you could communicate with any of, the, any of us, uh, with Eduardo or Monique or myself. Here are our emails. Thank you very much. Thanks. And just before Cheryl goes to questions, I just wanted to thank folks and, and really just shout out to this entire crowd that we have today, 100 people in the East uh, to help us with the outreach. Um, we really, as you can see, that was really, um, you know, we wanted to give you a lot of background to this excellent work going on. And I, I wanted to shout out to, to all the Hamilton, you know, Eduardo mentioned a couple of folks that had, you know, um, blazed this trail and my colleague Val's on holidays and we would have had her here introducing these guys. So I wanted to shout out to her as well. And I know I missed lots of names, but um, yeah, so help us, help us, uh, you know, get this word out. Um, you might know a cousin or a friend or has somebody working at a, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to branch outreach this, you know, grow this branch in the East um, with these excellent projects and we, and we need, we need um, we need all the local knowledge we can get. Over to you. Thanks, Cheryl. Sorry. Okay. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Baker, and I'm with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. And I would like to ask that you either raise your hand to ask a question, or if you'd like to put it into the chat, I will read it to the presenters, and they will answer for us. So I already have a question from Hector Almandres, and he's asking. Sorry, Almandres. He's asking, what is the ideal capacity for occupational health and safety services in Ottawa, Ontario? And does OCAL have enough people to serve these workers? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you, that, <laughs> you can always count on me for uh, direct transparency. But uh, and you can always, always, oh, sorry. Yeah. You can always yeah. send an email to us and uh, or to myself cbaker at ocow.on.ca and we can give you a little bit more information or detail regarding that um also have a hand up for chrissy tromley you can go ahead chrissy thank you um i have a colleague who actually uh is filipino and has been supporting um migrant um, guest workers for quite some time including sheltering them at her own home um, has there been consideration of other languages to translate those documents into? Because we know we've got foreign workers from Caribbean, from Philippines, from other Asian countries. And so having it in more languages might draw more uh, responses as well. And mm -hmm. certainly I'll, I'll reach out to my colleague and uh, connect her and her, she has a whole network of supports, uh, a, whole, a church that's kind of connected with a lot of these workers that they mm -hmm. connect with. So there are, there's a, probably a lot of people who know a lot of things in the Ottawa area that need to know these links and, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll certainly share it as, as, as widely as we can. Thank you. Uh, sorry, to, I didn't get to finish that. Of course, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, be that flippant. But I, I you know, uh, David usually, um, and he can come on to help us out. But I, um, you know, we're always chasing. We are chasing funding for all of our work. We're really happy to have um, this additional funding on these projects. But we are, um, we are, we are doing amazing work with the resources that we have, um, and we're always looking for. For additional funding so uh, you know I wouldn't be so flippant as to just have a one-word answer I just wanted to finish that 
um, to Hector's question. Uh, but we are, uh, we do have a vast and can answer many, many questions. We have an inquiry service, we have a, um, a group service, we have uh, these workshop and knowledge translation services. Uh, so our, we're wide, wide and well reaching and we absolutely can. Uh, but, you know, when it's a direct question like that, I just also wanted to throw in, um, you know, that we are always looking for additional funding opportunities. So, yeah. And in terms of that, that um, part of it, too, um, in that question, so in the other regions where the numbers, uh, for example, of agricultural workers have been even higher, um, in those regions, it's been the same challenge, right, as to, as to how, you know, what is the impact at the larger scale among all of these workers? So the strategies often are, you know, we, we try to work with different farms at the, at the workplace level, we try to work with different farms, different seasons. So the safety glasses were definitely a way that we kind of got in uh, to the employer by this, you know, lure of we're providing these safety glasses and then later on so switching up the workplaces and and but it's true it's you know we're a small team and um, as Leonor's done this great mapping of all these workplaces um, it starts then considering developing a useful strategy um, and I think that uh, and maybe Leonor you um, have uh, more to, to respond as well in terms of, of, of Chrissy's um, comments that's that's great and we'd be so excited to receive those uh, connections um in in the other regions we are already connected to uh, Filipino workers so it seems in, in the agricultural sector as as well as in the greenhouses both um, mostly in the greenhouses in the west the the top communities that, that are are being employed are from Mexico uh, Guatemala now has surpassed in numbers uh, and the data uh, Caribbean workers uh, but we're seeing a rise in Filipino workers as well as Thai workers. Um, so we have uh, materials translated into Tagalog and Thai, um, but those local connections that you have sound amazing for us. That would be, that'd be a, a great thing. And, and I think Leonor is also, in terms of the nail salons, um, we've, you know, Leonor's done mapping around um, the, the cultural communities that are, are being employed in, 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 in those salons being uh, majority, majority uh, Vietnamese. And so we have a position that we're also eventually going to fill of a Vietnamese outreach worker for our, for our project, who then will focus in on, on that outreach, similar to the Toronto project, having, you know, uh, an outreach worker um, uh, be, be there as well. So I don't know if Leonor, if that, if that yeah. Well, I, I would like to ask Chris to, to send us the, the information to communicate with, with us. I wrote the emails, our emails down there. And yes, we have the uh, most of the materials, if not all uh, of the materials that we have of, up to now in different languages. But uh, here in Ottawa, we also need to look first what uh, sectors we are, are going to work with uh, besides the uh, agricultural workers. And maybe I'll ask that Cheryl adds the emails to the chat because they might be less accessible um, on the slide presentation. I will do that, thank you. And uh, I have one more question, please, from Kevin Hedges. Go ahead, Kev. Yeah, just uh, really amazing work, Eduardo and Leonor. So just, it's really fabulous to see what you're doing. I just had, when I saw the information on nail salon workers, it kind of piqued my interest. <clears throat> so Workplace Health with board, at Borders, have a working group on, on nail salon workers, an international working group. So that's just a comment, but my question was, you, we, I kind of saw map all the different nail salons around Ottawa, and maybe this is premature, but has there been any discussion about like looking at trying to put Corsi Rosenthal boxes in all those nail salons to make the air kind of cleaner? Thank you. Uh, yes, well, that. Uh, actually, in the first five visits that we uh, did to the nail salons, what we distributed was the uh, uh, how to use to properly use our respirator and, and explaining them that this is not for vapors <laughs> because they are also uh, exposed to to, to vapors uh, besides besides particulate uh, matter, and also we uh, offered them. The, uh, to build a, a, a sea air box, a air cleaner uh, as well. But well, we haven't heard from back from them and we will continue visiting the, work, the, the workplaces and see how uh, they will become interested and then to uh, follow in to the next uh, level of 
uh, collaboration with them. Thank you. Okay. And, and, Thank we, you. And, and we would like to knock your door, Kevin. <laughs> 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 Once you are in, in Ottawa. <laughs> Door is always open. I live in Ottawa. So. Okay, so <laughs> I'd like to thank um, Eduardo and Leonor for their wonderful uh, presentation. Please um, uh, reach out to them uh, if you have any information that can help uh, with the project. It's critically important. Um, we want to make sure that all workers uh, in uh, Canada can work safely no matter what their status is. It's now um, our break time. Uh, it's- uh, Laura, uh, Laura. Yes? Dorothy, just before you take a break, can I just put in a one quick plug? Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just, I just put a, a note in the chat that there's similar work, although not with the nail salons going on in Quinty, Northumberland, um, Belleville, uh, Kingston area. And uh, so if folks have connections there and ideas about uh, people that we should be reaching out to, um, my email is in the chat. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Thanks. Okay, so if we could be back at 1030 sharp uh, to uh, be begin with our next um, uh, speakers and Paul LaHayes will be doing the introductions. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, as Sean uh, mentioned earlier, my name is Paula Hayes. I uh, work at Algonquin College. I'm a member of OPSU, and uh, I sit on the uh, local advisory committee for OCAO. And um, I'm here. I'm proud to uh, introduce. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Pravesh Jagnandan. He's an occupational health and family physician with an active medical practice for over 25 years. He is a fellow of the Canadian Board of Occupational Medicine, the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, and the College of Family Physicians of Canada. He has an occupational medicine. He is he has been an occupational medicine consultant to OCAO for more than 15 years. He currently he is currently on OCAO's COVID response team providing workplace related COVID advice. He served on the executive of the Ontario Medical Association. Uh, section on occupational environmental medicine, occupational environmental medical association of Canada, and the Ontario chapter of the American College of Occupation and Environmental Medicine. And also, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Margaret Keys. She is a lawyer with the Ocu the Office of the Worker Advisory. She has worked as a legislative interpretation specialist in the legal unit of the OWA since 2007. Margaret assists on the OWA assists on the OWA's worker advisors with complex cases, legal research, and submissions. Prior to joining OWA, Margaret worked as a staff lawyer in community legal clinics as a grievance officer with OPSU. Welcome. I think I need to share my screen, uh, Paul. Someone has to give me that. Jennifer will give you a uh, co-host privileges so you can do that. You're good to go, Pravesh. Okay, I'll click on share screen and let's click on that. And let's see, share, start from the beginning and hopefully that's working. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the LAC and OCAO Ottawa for the invitation. Uh, my presentation today <clears throat> from my side is not uh, academic. It's it's just my experience uh, with dealing with uh, COVID and especially long COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, conflict of interest. I have no conflict of interest. I do consult for OCAO and the learning objectives. Like I said, just long COVID and the basics and, and we'll go along and see, see how it goes. I just want to put my timer on here. So uh, make sure I'm on time. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to long COVID, there's definitely no consensus definition. And this definition is still evolving. And hopefully as time goes ahead, we will honed on in a specific definition of what, what's long COVID. Uh, there may be some controversy about how it's defined, but I'll get to that. 
currently there's no diagnostic criteria and there's no set clinical guidelines that are available that's widely accept acceptable. I, I consider it, from my experience, a condition of variables. Uh, from the patients I see, everything is variable from very minimal symptoms to significantly fully disabling symptoms, from durations that last you know, just two, three, four months to patients that are going on for one and a half to two years now. The clinical uh, presentation is all over the place from a single symptom to multiple symptoms. Some can be severe, some can be mild. And to top it all, there's lots and lots of unknowns in, in this condition. Like I said, uh, the definition is still evolving. What's kind of accepted now, the acute phase is the first four weeks of the disease. So we know uh, day 14 is considered when the people are recovered from the infective phase. And we extended that to four weeks to say this is the acute phase. So long COVID is defined as two weeks after the acute, two months after the acute phase. So three months from the start of your illness, first four weeks is the acute phase and the next eight weeks is the recovery phase and anything that extends after that is considered uh, long COVID. The WHO and the CDC says not explained by an alternative, di alternative diagnosis. So if you investigate in your patient and you find, you know, there's another reason why they're having the symptoms, this definition says it's not, it's not, can't be considered as part of COVID or long COVID. There's some controversy over this, and some organizations are saying it should say not, not attributed uh, to COVID. Uh, it's like someone with a stable cardiac disease uh, that gets COVID and gets pushed into cardiac failure, and they picked up COVID at work. Uh, the insurance companies are going to turn around and say that's not related to COVID. Uh, people are arguing that is definitely attributed to COVID because you wouldn't have went into cardiac failure if you did not get COVID in the first place. So definitions are important and there's a subtle difference in there. So in simple terms, history of a probable or confirmed, and this is important, it does not have to be confirmed COVID infection. Like I said, three months after the onset of the infection, uh, I discussed cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Now, the symptoms may be new. You may have symptoms from the beginning and it may persist throughout, or you may get new symptoms as time goes on. This will also be related to long COVID. And the symptoms can wax and wane, so it can fluctuate. It can go away, it can come back, it can increase in intensity, and it can decrease in intensity. Some stats in Canada, as of uh, 10 days ago, our numbers were at 4.5 million, 4.6 million, and 52,000 deaths. From Public Health uh, Canada, we know that our stats in Canada is almost at 15% of people with long COVID. Uh, the global statistics, if you look around, range anything from 10 to 15%, and we're obviously on the high end of that, around 15%. And what we find that at, at the um, um, at the one-year mark, at least 50%, 47% of people are still symptomatic. So half the people that start off at one year is still symptomatic. And of the people, uh, this 15%, we find that at least 21% report, it does have a functional impact on their life and what they do. So, so very important. So, so these, these, these are large numbers of people. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, I mean, uh, put out a statement, and I think the, the, the person in charge uh, referred to it as potentially a mass disabling if, uh, effect uh, in, in the, the country. And what I'm seeing is that, and what's written in the literature, there's a local effect, obviously, on the health of the patient themselves, but it affects the family, it affects the spouse, it affects the workplace, it affects the community, it affects the social programs that are in place. So it's not an individual condition and potentially it has far reaching consequences. So post acute COVID, long COVID, many names still evolving is potentially a multi-system disease. Uh, it does not only affect one system. Uh, the, the clinical management generally has to involve the entire patient. Uh, sometimes we have patients that come in with single, single complaints or single symptoms, but generally you, you have to take an entire patient uh, perspective because 
you know, it's a whole patient that's presenting and, and that's just good, good medicine. Generally, people that were in ICU for a long time, uh, you know, they, they have uh, they need specialist care. Sorry, there's a, there's a beep coming on to admit people and hopefully someone else is doing that in the background there. Uh, why are some people uh, affected more than others? I mean, simply we don't know. That's, that's a simple answer. We know from past coronavirus, uh, SARS-1 and MERS, uh, similar pathophysiological perils uh, existed. And they, those people had you know, long-term respiratory, musculoskeletal, and neuropsychiatric uh, issues going on. So this is another corona coronavirus. Uh, possible uh, mechanisms, disruption of the immune system. Uh, so it may be on the basis of immune dysregulation. Uh, some people talk about chronic inflammation that doesn't settle. Uh, endothel endothelial dysfunction, these, these are the cells that line all the blood vessels. Uh, persistent of viral or viral particles or relapse. Uh, there has been uh, talks and studies about the microclots that end up all over the body. Microchondrial dysfunction, this, this, these are the energy producing blocks in your cells. So these don't work, it may explain the, um, the fatigue. Uh, and the effects on the microbiome, the, the, um, uh, the, the lining of the gut. Uh, just for interest, COVID-19 disrupts the gut uh, microbiome. So studies are coming out all the time on the possible mechanisms. And while looking through this, I came across another study that said gut microbes may affect motivation to exercise. So there's lots and lots in the gut, gut microbiome uh, that we, we are still learning about, but with time, hopefully, we'll establish links. The risk factors, why, who, who, are, who, who are at increased risk, uh, we, we don't know, but we do know that if you get repeat infections, you're more at risk. Uh, independent risk factors are the female sex, definitely higher in the female sex. The severity of the infection, the more severe your infection was, the more likely you to go on with long-term symptoms. If you are hospitalized, that relates to that. And if you have comorbid uh, medical issues, uh, chronic uh, heart disease, COPD, et cetera. Uh, how do you diagnose the condition? Uh, laboratory diagnostic testing, there's no testing available. So I cannot do a blood test to say you have COVID. Uh, if you do have a positive uh, viral test, either PCR or, or rat test, uh, that, that's good. Uh, a serological test where you're looking at recent past infections, so serology may pick it up after you've recovered, you know, maybe a month or a little bit longer, just depending on the test. It can confirm that you had uh, COVID. However, definitely uh, large organizations are saying that a laboratory test is not required to establish the diagnosis of post-COVID conditions. And the reason for this is that we know there were lots of issues around testing. One is that uh, many of these tests are not 100% accurate. In the early days, testing was not available to everyone. And currently, testing is being you know, downgraded. You can hardly get testing done. And the rapid tests are, there's lots of false negatives of the rapid test. Um, we know that some patients who develop post-COVID conditions were asymptomatic or barely symptomatic. And that's definitely the case now with the infections we are seeing uh, clinically. Uh, people generally tend to have mild uh, symptoms and they misattribute that to, you know, I just got a cold, allergy, flu, or whatever else. And people are not testing as often as before. And in the early days, besides uh, testing being very limited, uh, people were still learning how to, you know, just physically, how do you do this test properly? How deep nasopharyngeal do you need to go? Uh, how do you store it? How do you transport it? And the labs themselves were still um, evolving their testing mechanisms. And, and we have some WSIB cases, which I'll, I'll touch over uh, soon. Uh, very broadly, some the symptom complex, there's, there's basically four symptom complexes. There's physical symptoms you can com complain of, you know, aches, pains, palpitations, chest pain, stuff like that. Psychological uh, complaints um, related to the mind, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and neurocognitive complaints, uh, poor memory, concentration, and the fourth one is, you know, any combination of these three. Uh, postulation on the ACE uh, receptors that are found throughout the body. And these are the various symptoms. And we know that over 100 symptoms have been uh, attributed to, uh, to COVID and its effects. 
Uh, clinically, I mean, I, from, from my experience and, and reported in the literature, the most disabling uh, symptoms is the, is the fatigue uh, that persists. And what we find is this fatigue is kind of not, not static. It's relapsing rheumatic. So it'll be up, it'll be down, it'll be good days. It'll, I, I, yesterday I was able to go for a, you know half an hour walk. Today I can't even walk for 10 minutes. So fatigue seems to be the, the most one of the most disabling symptoms. Lots of parallels with uh, chronic fatigue syn uh, syndrome, myalgic ME. And we find that almost 50% of people with, with this chronic fatigue may fit that diagnosis. And, and this is what we've seen in, in clinical practice. I mean, I, I recall a patient uh, recently said, you know, bas basically after, after a while she said, but you have to give me a diagnosis. And, and I couldn't. I didn't get to that immediately. And she said, no, I need the diagnosis because I need to apply for disability. <laughs> and if my insurance company doesn't get a diagnosis, I, I can't apply for it. And that makes totally total sense because lots of places uh, don't accept post-COVID uh, condition syndrome as, as a diagnostic entity. Uh, so sometimes we have to look at other, other avenues of doing this. Uh, Brain fog is, 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 a, is another common complaint I see is, is people that kind of did things, you know, routine, suddenly they're having difficulty. Uh, prevention, I mean, the best way to prevent uh, COVID, uh, long COVID is don't get COVID, so get immunized. So we know that some studies have shown that being immunized, being vaccinated, appears to decrease the incidence of low, uh, long COVID. Uh, there's some evidence that the antivirals are making a difference, uh, Paxlovid, And there's some studies that say uh, receiving the COVID uh, vaccine again has improved patient symptoms. Uh, COVID care, Paxlovid, the treatment for COVID is available uh, by, from, from your primary care provider and also avail available from pharmacies. Uh, a little bit of reluctance in, in, in prescribing the medication in, in the high-risk group, uh, especially the elderly, because there's a ton of uh, cross-reactions uh, between, between the medication. So you, most people uh, will end up having to stop a whole lot of medications before they can take plaques over. So it's, you know, it's just not a simple thing of taking the medication. Just some background, uh, Long COVID Resources Canada, it's, it's, a, it's a good website to look at. It, it will send you in the right direction uh, and help you along. Uh, lots of primary care providers, you know, they, they themselves are battling um, on, on what, where the resources are. So if you've seen your physician, you know, browse this website, uh, Rehabilitation Care Alliance, again, rehabilitation facilities. Uh, first one is probably better. Um, healthcare appointment checks, checklist for post-COVID. From practical experience, these are not easy appointments. So my advice to patients is prepare for your appointment. Clearly list how you need to prepare. Uh, it, this, this for most of us, you know, it's, it's like, why do we need to do this? But you have to understand there's a significant amount of people with long COVID that this becomes a difficult thing. Uh, the diagnosis is unclear. People are not believing them. They're not being trusted. It's, it's creating this vicious circle that's creating more stress in the life. Um, one day the good, one day the bad, one day they can walk, next day they're totally fatigued. Uh, so simple thing as a doctor's appointment becomes a major task. So if, if you follow these guidelines, you find in the long run, it's, it's going to be beneficial. So prepare for your appointment, know what you're going to talk about, document your symptoms, and documenting symptoms is very, very important because that's the only way you can judge your progress because you need to sit down with your physician or your nurse practitioner or your healthcare provider and say, these are my symptoms now and we have to work out a plan, especially if you're having chronic fatigue, uh, brain fog, because there's a process of doing that. And a common mistake I see is people say, no, you just need to push through it. Now you have to understand that people with chronic fatigue syndromes, no, you don't have to push through it. That's the wrong thing to do because you end up going to end up with post-exertional uh, malaise and you end up worse. So you have to have a structured uh, program and your structured program is not in, in, it's not a linear line in one, one direction. It is ups and downs and ups and downs, but you will get better and improve. So 
simple, but you need to follow this. Uh, in, in Ontario, we know that the ODSP uh, defines uh, disability as a, having a substantial mental or physical impairment that continues, that is continuous or, re or recurrent and is expected to last more than one year. And it has a direct impact on, on your function, ability to work here for the self or take part in community life. And I'm sure Margaret will cover some of this. Uh, in the US, we know that long COVID is recognized as a disability under the Amer Americans with Disabilities Act and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the College of Family Physicians have put up, uh, put out a income support application for long COVID patients, tips to family doctors on what to do, how to support your patients. Uh, a great website, uh, Benefits Way Way Wayfinder, again, to help you to take control. Uh, kind of lists the different benefits that you can find uh, available in Canada and your and your province. It goes through everything. So, so you know, it'll it'll take you in the right direction. Pravesh, you uh, have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, talk very quickly, uh, WSIB. We have uh, quite a few patients. Myself, uh, Cheryl, the occupational health nurse from uh, Ottawa. Uh, sorry, Tracy, the occupational health nurse from Ottawa. Cheryl, the administrative support. And uh, under Kimberly's guidance, we've been working with these WSIB files. Uh, so, so couple of things about the WSIB. One, they denied lots of cases on day 14. They, WSIB initially believed day 14, everything ends, you're fit to go back to work. So we we, we find, kind of figured out a way to fight that. Uh, the second set we have is that testing was negative, although diagnostic testing was not done. So we have another cluster of those patients we are working up on, and, and hopefully as time goes, we, we're going to be win, winning, winning some of that. Uh, WSIB for the longest time and up to today, I haven't, uh, they, they don't kind of recognize post COVID uh, conditions. Again, it's due to or attributed to this. This is a subtle difference, but we're still fighting that. Uh, we have patients with, with complications uh, either from the immunization or COVID or undiagnosed COVID neurological complications uh, that ended up in ICU. We, we're trying to handle those cases. Uh, like I said, sometimes there were no diagnosis of, of, of COVID itself. And we can see the accepted cases of, of COVID steadily declined in the WSIB, um, barely nothing in December last year. Um, and, and the rest, rest of my uh, presentation is just guidelines that, that you, I'm sure you can browse and some research that's going on locally can treat COVID, looking at you know, the diff different effectiveness of treatments available, the cost effectiveness, looking at di different populations uh, based on diverse social demographic uh, information, and also looking at uh, the effect on re reducing post-acute uh, sequelae of COVID, long COVID. Uh, these are just uh, research studies and some resources. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions later or now. I think I made it on time, Cheryl. Wonderful, thank you. And Margaret Keys will be up next, if uh, you're ready, Margaret. Jennifer. And how do I stop sharing? I just press stop sharing. That exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Prabesh. And we'll do questions after Margaret, if that works for you. Sure, thank you. Okay. Oh, I sat down that way down here. While Margaret pulls up her slides, I just wanted to say um, Tracy was able to join us and her name has been mentioned so many times today, I just thought she might want to say hi to our occupational health nurse in Ottawa, Tracy. But uh, Pravesh just talked about working on this project together as well. Hi, everybody. Tra Tra yeah, Tra Tracy keeps me on track and, and she's <laughs> fantastic to work with. Oh, thank you very, very much for the very kind words. Welcome, everybody. I hope everyone's enjoying their um, Spring into Action Day today. And uh, thank you, Kimberly, for giving me the opportunity to say hello. Yeah, I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about getting entitlement for long COVID um, under in the workers' compensation system. There are multiple hurdles uh, to entitlement. Um, uh, they are first proving there, there was an initial 
COVID-19 infection, proving that it was related to work and proving that the worker has a long COVID condition. I'm going to take you through the board's requirements for each of these and tell you how I think the tribunal will consider it. We don't have decisions from the tribunal yet. Um, so it's a guess about what the, how they'll handle them. Um, but we can see some of what the board has done and see their um, adjudicative support documents. Uh, so um, between March of 2020 and June of 2022, uh, the board allowed about 70% of the claims for initial entitlement for COVID. In 2020, that amounted to about 10,000 cases. In 2021, 20,000. And from January to May 2022, it was 17,000. June 2022 marked the end of the board's public reporting on COVID case numbers. They used to have them up on their website. They don't any longer. And that coincided with the end of lockdowns and mask mandates. Also beginning in June 2022, the board's web start site started saying that most COVID infections will not be work-related. So the first hurdle is proving that the worker had a COVID infection. Um, the, board, um, the board's draft policy says that um, that a PCR test for a diagnosis by a health professional based on a clinical assessment will be required. They do offer an exception though, if the worker didn't seek a test or see a doctor because the illness was short-lived or testing wasn't available, the board will accept a doctor's opinion that the worker's presentation is compatible with communicable illness. Um, so this sounds like that if a doctor says that a worker's presentation looks like a post-COVID syndrome, that the board will accept that the worker did have it, COVID. So it sounds reasonable, but what remains to be seen is how strictly the board applies the exception um, uh, about not seeing a doctor immediately. For the tribunal, we don't know yet, but at a minimum, a doctor's confirmation that the worker had COVID or likely had COVID will, will be required. And I expect that the tribunal will give weight to evidence about a home rapid antigen test. Um, so a time-stamped photo of a positive test would be persuasive evidence at the tribunal. Um, notably, the board's draft policy on communicable illnesses doesn't mention rapid tests. The second and biggest hurdle to proving work-relatedness is the second and biggest hurdle is going to be proving work relatedness. Um, in the board's draft policy on communicable illnesses, they set out a two part test that um, the, the, the COVID infection must arise out of and in the course of employment. They define in the course of employment as, as being that the worker was exposed and contracted the illness at work. And for arising out of employment, um, the worker has to show that the risk of infection at work uh, was greater than the risk of infection faced by the general public. So this requirement that risk of infection at work be greater than the risk faced by the public at large is long standing in the board's approach to infectious disease. And so I expect it to remain in the final policy, um, even though it's contrary to the legal test for entitlement. Under the act for an injury or illness to be compensable, it must arise out of and in the course of employment. So the policy gets that part of it right. What they get wrong is what it means to arise out of employment. So in the course of just means that it happened at work. Um, and arising out of traditionally means that it was caused by work. So, um, an injury does not arise out of employment, even if it happened at work, if the cause of the injury was unrelated to work. The classic example is of a worker who is assaulted at work by a coworker because of a non-work dispute. Like they were neighbors who had been arguing for weeks about a property line dispute. 
And if the property line dispute then was the reason for the assault, there would be no entitlement for the worker's injury. So even though the injury occurred at work, because the assault itself had nothing to do with work, it, it doesn't arise out of employment because the cause of the conflict was unrelated to the work. But this doesn't map onto the, uh, a COVID infection situation. If a worker gets COVID um, because of working with a COVID positive coworker, um, because they were working in the same area, because they were interacting with each other, that is how the infection would be spread. The infection arises out of work. It, it's not something that's separate from work, their interaction. Their interaction is um, work-related. So the board's definition of arising out of employment, that the risk of infection at work be greater than the risk of infection faced by the general public, severely restricts in entitlement. The policy says that you, you have to prove that you were infected in the course of employment. That is, you were infected at work. And in addition to that, you have to show that there was an elevated risk of infection at work, greater than that faced by the general public. The board's adjudicative approach document on COVID that was in effect up to June of 2022. And this earlier communicable disease um, document um, that came out of dated 2011, um, they also contain this requirement of an elevated risk at work, but there's an important distinction between those documents and the draft policy. Those earlier documents su suggested that showing that the worker came into contact with a COVID infected person at work would prove the elevated risk. Um, you didn't also have to show this more general uh, elevated risk at work. So the, the policy does say that, um, that those who work in close contact with um, COVID patients, so healthcare workers and um, those who support COVID patients uh, and those workers who are living in employer provided group accommodation like Margaret, migrant farm workers and remote mining and forestry camps. Um, that the policy says that those people um, do have an elevated risk of uh, infection. And the policy does also create an exception um, when there is a government declared public health emergency. So during public health emergency, essential workers will also be considered to, to face an elevated risk of infection at work. But outside of the public health emergency, in-person interactions with coworkers, clients and customers will not be recognized as creating a risk of infection greater than that faced by the general public. And so those people will not be entitled under board policy. Um, at the tribunal though, um, I don't think that the tribunal will, will apply this test as enunciated by the board. The general test applied by the tribunal is whether it is more probable than not that work factors made a significant contribution to the worker's injury or disease. Um, the another way of putting it is whether the occupational exposure was a significant contributing factor in the worker's illness. It doesn't have to be the sole cause. Um, and, and this is the test that is applied in that has been applied in the tribunal's uh, influenza decisions. Um, decision, and in particular, decision um, 136514 um, rejected the elevated risk analysis um, that had been enunciated in the, um, in the prior level of decision making at the ARO. 
in that case, it involved an influenza case of a, with a healthcare worker. And um, the, the fact that um, there were only a few people, blind patients uh, that had influenza and not um, uh, well, in that case, actually, uh, there had been um, the, the hospital had declared that there was um, um, a widespread infection, but the arrow had rejected that and, and found that there wasn't a greater risk than that faced by the general public because only a couple of patients had the flu, but the tribunal rejected that. So there was ample evidence that um, work exposures uh, likely caused the worker's infection. The elevated risk analysis is, is completely foreign to our system. Workers who are injured at work have entitlement. They don't also have to show that there was an increased risk of injury at their workplace. The fact that they were injured is enough. Of course, evidence about an elevated risk of infection at work will be very important um, as it will go to the question of the likelihood that the worker was exposed at work um, and whether work made a significant contribution to the worker's illness. And in our system, it's supposed to be, um, uh, it's supposed to be good for work injured workers because we also have the section 124.2 benefit of the doubt. So if there are two competing theories about the source of infection, and the evidence for each is about equal, the worker gets the benefit of the doubt. So the, if the worker was exposed to an infected coworker, but also exposed at home or, or the worker's spouse developed symptoms around the same time so that the worker could have been exposed at work or at home and got the infection that way, the benefit of the doubt should go to the worker and the worker should get entitlement. Um, but then you may ask, but isn't the board, isn't the tribunal bound by board policy? Um, they are bound by board policy, but I still don't think the tribunal will apply the relative risk, the elevated risk analysis, because there's enough wiggle room in the draft policy for the tribunal to apply the accepted test. Uh, the policy says um, the illness must arise out of and in the course of employment. And I think that um, the tribunal will just apply the regularly accepted test rather than um, rather than trying to uh, to uh, uh, apply the, the board's definition of arising out of employment. In the WSIAT flu cases, though, the worker had to show that they had contact with someone at work who had the flu. So I think um, as a practical matter at the tribunal, we're going to have to show that the worker um, can identify a person who had was COVID positive in the workplace before they can get entitlement. There will be cases though, where it is more probable than not that the worker became infected at work rather than elsewhere, um, but they are unable to identify a specific contact. For example, a retail worker um, who's exposed to dozens of people every day at work, but sees few people outside of work. In those cases, I think we can argue at the tribunal to weigh the likelihood of exposure at work against exposure in non-occupational activities and to apply the benefit of the doubt. Now, it will be a heavy lift. Um, and in terms of weighing exposure, um, we'll be looking at uh, detailed evidence for exposures at work, um, looking at the ventilation of the workplace, um, the rate of air exchanges, the number of contacts, proximity to coworkers, customers, clients, the number of shared touch services, the, the, the amount of time spent at work, the use of personal protective equipment like masks and gloves, and weigh those exposures against non-work exposures. So home and social contacts, uh, what non-work activities was the worker involved in 
was it did the worker commute take public transit to work go out to restaurants movies concerts travel and whether they used personal protective equipment in any of those activities Uh, and the final hurdle is proving long COVID. Um, now, my sense of this was that with the awareness amongst doctors about long COVID, so long as the initial COVID infection is accepted as work-related, it should be fairly straightforward to get entitlement for severe long COVID cases. Um, we have one severe case, it's an employer appeal, um, and the worker was hospitalized and intubated. And the board has so far allowed entitlement for everything that the workers, doctors and specialists report as being due to COVID. Um, and the one thing that surprised me was that they allowed entitlement for worsening diabetes and worsening hearing loss. Um, both of these were pre-existing, um, but the specialists were supported that the deterioration was related to COVID and it was allowed. Margaret, you have two minutes. Okay. In long COVID cases with mild to moderate symptoms though, it will be much more difficult um, because uh, the typical symptoms of um, long COVID, of brain fog, fatigue and pain are hard to measure um, and they're not necessarily specific to long COVID. Um, and as far as now assessments go, um, there is problems with that as well, as the AMA guides don't have uh, a good way of rating things like brain fog, fatigue, um, and joint pain. Um, the, and because of the lengthy and unknown recovery times, um, that will delay assessments. Uh, and last month we asked um, the board how they were doing now assessments in COVID cases and they told us they were working on it, that they haven't figured it out yet. So in conclusion, it's um, a really tough call um, proving entitlement for long COVID um, from Proving the initial in infection, um, and particularly now during the lockdown, when many employers were screening employees, um, particularly in the healthcare setting, um, then you could catch asymptomatic COVID cases. Now you can't. Um, proving work relatedness outside of healthcare and shared accommodation situations is going to be very difficult uh, because of the inability to identify specific infected contacts and proving mild to moderate long COVID cases, also very difficult due to the non-specificity of symptoms and pre-existing conditions. And that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagnangden and Margaret Keyes. Much appreciated. Once again, Cheryl Baker from the Occupational Health Clinic for Ontario Workers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if you have any questions, if you could please raise your hand and or type it in the chat. If you can direct it to Dr. Jagnangden or Margaret, it would be appreciated. And then we'll see if we can answer your questions for you. Everybody's eating lunch. No. <laughs> okay, so I do have uh, some hands up here. I'll go with Hector first, please, if you'd like to speak. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for, for that. I just wanted to know um, if you remember when uh, rapid tests, like the date that rapid tests were became first available. Um, yeah, it's a very specific question. Yeah, I don't... I, I, <laughs> I don't know, Pravish? No, some sometimes in 2022, I would say early 2022. I, I'm guessing. Any any specific reason you are seeing that, uh, Victor? Yeah, well, I just have a child in, in daycare. Uh, mm. And I just remember at one point, uh, there was like kind of a rumor that 
it had kind of ripped through daycare, but like no one really said anything. And we had all gotten pretty sick at that time. And I'm like just searching in my mind around when that was. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I don't remember having tested for it um, because maybe we just thought it was a cold at the time. But yeah, yeah. I, was just, I was just trying to remember. Yeah, so 2022 was, January 2022 yeah. was the beginning of uh, like, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to talk about okay. my medical stuff, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Hector. Uh, next in line is Laura Lazinski, please. Uh, hi, uh, my question is for Margaret. So I'm, I'm just uh, making sure I heard you right, Margaret. You said um, at one point during your presentation that a worker might have to prove that another worker was sick in the workplace in order to qualify. And I'm wondering if that's the case, then what happens with privacy issues? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, like how can you, you can't force your like you can't get access to your coworkers' um, medical records, so you can't know whether or not they had COVID. So um, it's very difficult to outside of healthcare, but even in healthcare, it's it'll be the patients that you can ask the employer for. Uh, give evidence about whether any of the patients were positive for COVID. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's. I, I yeah, so I, I'm thinking probably family. it's going to be more in an office setting. I think, as you pointed out, if you're working in public facing jobs, it'd be, it should be easier to qualify. But say you were working in an office or something like that where people are more confined away from the public. I'm just um, um, kind of stunned that they would even consider um, trying to make that a requirement. Um, it's more that you, in order to prove that you got infected at work, you've got to be able to find somebody who gave it to you at work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and privacy prevents you from identifying who might have been infected, who might have infected you at work, because you can't force your coworkers to give you their medical records. You can't force a coworker to get a COVID test. Um, and certainly for people like in retail situations, when there are many, many contacts with the public, just people they don't know, you can't like after the fact find out if if somebody you'd spend an hour with that day later tested positive for COVID or developed symptoms. Yeah, I think from some of the cases we have, uh, the coworkers freely disclosed that they had COVID. Um, and in those cases, it was much easier for the WSIB to say, okay, we kind of verified that some way or the other. Uh, it wasn't sort of private medical information. Uh, and and often you have that coworkers will really you know say I had COVID or I recovered from COVID or I was sick and I have to stay at home because of COVID and many other things. Thank you to both of you, um, Kevin Hedges. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Margaret. Um, and I have absolutely no idea around workers' compensation law, so this might sound a bit naive. Um, but you know, I can't really get my head around, and I know others will know this much more than I do, <clears throat> the no-fault no system, you know, how, how does an employer be held accountable um, if, you know, if they can't be pinged through, you know, the WSIB? It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. So it seems to me that the only way forward, you know, to hold employers accountable is through inspections and regulate, like, in, in, in orders. But I'm just wondering if you'd care to comment on that. The no fault system. Well, the no fault system means that even if even if um, part of the reason for the injury or accident is the worker's fault, that um, they're still entitled to benefits. So the worker doesn't have to show that there was negligence on the part of the employer was the reason for their illness or injury. Um, and it applies to workers too. So in the COVID context, if a worker, if the employer's rule was that the worker wear a mask to work, 
but the worker didn't wear a mask and got COVID, they should still be entitled um, because it's a no-fault system. You can't blame the worker mm -hmm. for their own injury. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. I have a question in the chat from Tracy Bryce. She's asking, wouldn't the employer's COVID plan or lack of one be evidence? Whoa, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just all moved. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, people are putting things, okay, I wrote it down here. Evidence of likelihood of contracting it at work. If, do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. Or repeat it? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Wouldn't the employer's COVID plan or a lack of one be evidence of likelihood of contracting it at work? Yeah, I think, um that a lack of a plan, um, particularly during the lockdown phase when employers were supposed to have a plan of some kind, um, it would be evidence that it was more, that it, there was an increased likelihood of contracting COVID at work. Um, so it would be a piece of evidence. It wouldn't prove Yes, that alone wouldn't prove that the, the worker's COVID infection was work-related. But if you could say like the employer wasn't requiring anybody to wear masks, even though masks were required. Um, and uh, yeah, we, that would elevate the risk and make it more likely that the worker was infected at work. Wonderful. Thank you very much for answering those questions for us. I do not see any others in the chat or any hands up. So again, thank to Dr. Doug Nungden and to Margaret Keys. And I will turn it over to Kim Manette who will be introducing our next speaker. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Kevin Hedges. Uh, Kevin uh, has been a certified occupational hygienist and certified industrial hygienist with the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists and American Board of Industrial Hygiene, respectively. He moved from Australia to permanently reside in Canada in 2010. His professional experience has included working for a multinational mining and resources company, pharmaceutical industry, as a government occupational health regulator and inspector in both Australia and Canada and with academia. His professional employment is with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, through which he has helped facilitate numerous webinars related to COVID-19. Dr. Hedges has been a strong advocate for the acknowledgement of aerosol transmission of corona causing severe acute respiratory syndrome. Dr. Hedges has practiced for about 30 years in the professional discipline of occupational hygiene. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Hedges. Thanks very much for the warm introduction, Kim. Um, and thank you to everybody that's organized this and asking me to speak. Um, so I just thought I'd start off um, with a, you know, I was thinking about a title for the, this talk. And, and I thought like, you know, it's really comparing um, breathing clean air to drinking um, clean water. And I, I sort of bought a little prop with me. I, this is better in person, but I, I thought I'd sort of do this little um, demonstration anyway, just to start it off. So I've got a glass of water here. What I'm going to do is drink the water. I wouldn't do this in public, by the way. This is just for this group. Um, hand it to you all and say, now, would you would you drink this water? And, and I doubt many people here would, or anybody would want to drink water that I've drank, um, but, we're, but we're willing to breathe each other's air. Um, and now I'll just, um, I'll just share my presentation. Okay, so which brings me to, the title, um, Breathing Cleaner Air is as important as drinking clean water. What can we do? And I just want to provide a little bit of history. Um, you know, there's a lot of more attention now on, on John Snow. So John Snow was kind of an English physician, and he's considered one of the founders of, of modern epidemiology. 
And Jon Snow uh, really fought against the miasma theory. So at the time, um, you know, especially with cholera, everybody thought that, you know, it was floating around in the air. And if you have a look at the top there, you'll see this kind of big kind of ghoulish cloud with like um, skeleton feet coming out. And everybody's concerned about breathing cholera in from the air. Um, but, but it turns that Jon Snow, apart from being a physician, was very good with maths, or math, as you say here. And he, he did a lot of um, analysis to see where the outbreaks were. And, and what he was found was that from some of the, uh, the wells, or for this particular one in, in, in particular, there seemed to be a cl cluster of cholera cases. And so when he kind of, when they looked at it further, it was kind of um, from uh, contamination of, of cholera from a nappy actually through the, the water in the ground and, and people were drinking it. So he was able to um, convince people to take the handle from this well to stop people drinking that particular water. But he was up against a, a huge um, backlash to begin with. It took him a long time to, uh, to convince people that cholera was in the water. And then um, another person that I became aware of um, through the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, I, I never knew about Dr. Peter Bryce before, um, but he was responsible for the health of Indigenous children in schools. Um, and 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 he he actually named his report named poor ventilation and poor standards of care from the school officials as the primary cause of death of tuberculosis. Um, and unfortunately, his report was never published. It was highly politicized. He was forced to retire, and then after he retired, he actually wrote this um, the the, his, the, the, the a national crime. Um, uh, a story of injustice. So I highly recommend that people read this because it's really um, quite quite riveting. And uh, and I did actually visit um, Dr. Bryce's grave at Beechwood um, Cemetery, and and he's got a kind of a a modest grave behind a lot of other people that are was supposedly more important at the time. So he's a true hero in my eye, in my eyes. Um, so I, this, it's kind of a busy slide, but you know, uh, a lot of us have been advocating that um, you know, COVID nineteen is an aerosol transmissible disease. And I think if you're ever looking for evidence, this uh, paper by Trish Greenhouse and, and colleagues provides um, ten reasons to put support aerosol transmission, including super spreading events, transmission between adjacent rooms you know, the degree of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic spread, which accounts for about third, perhaps the 59% of transmission globally. Um, higher transmission indoors or higher infection occurring indoors than outdoors. Uh, non nosocomial infections, or that's healthcare required infections. Um, uh, viable COVID detected in the air in the absence of aerosol generating medical procedures. Uh, in, in air samples from infected persons' cars, um, finding it in air filters in building docks in hospitals, animals uh, involving ferrets in cages, um, interconnected um, by um, a, a pipe. And there's very limited evidence for, for other routes of transmission, such as respiratory droplet or thermite. Um, the John Snow Memorandum, obviously, I talked about John Snow before, so he's very symbolic. Um, and, you know, in October 2020, more than 7,000 medical professionals in scientific research signed the John Snow Memo, so it's published in the, the Lancet. Um, and more than two years now, it's becoming clear that all the mortality is reducing, although we don't know that from long COVID, do we, with our, our previous uh, talks. Um, but it's really putting a big health strain. So we need a vaccine plus strategy. Um, there's an amazing video um, on the, at the bottom right-hand corner there, and I've got a link to get there. Um, and I highly recommend that you watch it and you share it just to, to show how, you know, the uh, COVID particles or the, the, 
the aerosol containing the cavity, which is very small, can float around um, like smoke. And, you know, we're trying to kind of keep up to date with the evidence. Uh, all of the, uh, the webinars we've been provided have been evidence-based webinars. So we've been looked at looking at the latest papers. And, and when I was preparing for this, um, I came across this, um, this from the from the government Canada actually. Um, it's the the Canada Communicable Disease Report a, a month from the monthly issue. And what's it what it's saying is the incidence of outbreaks followed similar trends to case incidents. Outbreaks were most common in schools and childcare settings and industrial agricultural settings. Um, correctional facilities had the largest median outbreak size with 18 cases per outbreak, followed by long-term care facilities with 10, 10 cases per outbreak. Um, the, if we kind of look to the south of the border, um, we really can learn a lot from what's happening in the US. They, they're investing like a lot of money to you know to prepare for, for future pandemics and also improve air quality and uh, I, I don't see the same commitment to cleaning the air uh, in Canada but I you know maybe I haven't been looking closely enough but I just see an amazing amount of work coming out of the, the states um, so you know what is acceptable indoor air quality um, so there is a standard uh, by it from ASHRAE uh, 62.1, which just been re revised, defines acceptable indoor air quality as air in which there are no contaminants at harmful concentrations as determined by cognizant authorities and, and with which a substantial majority, 80% or more of people exposed do not express satisfaction. It's really, you know, it's, it's intended for, for regulatory application to new buildings, additions to existing buildings and changes to existing buildings. And it can guide the improvement of it. So it's a stepping stone to guide the improvement to ventilation. But I just want to make a point here that it's really still around comfort, um, mostly. And so when you look at what's happening, um, the, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and air conditioning engineers, which in other words, that's ASHRAE, that's what the acronym stands for. It's an American society and you'll find most many buildings uh, codes refer to uh, use ASHRAE and, and they provide some good technical guidance um, on their website or in this area. But they've also committed to developing a, an indoor air quality pathogen mitigation standard. So above uh, 62.1 and uh, so the, the new standard will be called 241 and it will address mitigation of airborne infection transmission. The new standard will cover existing and new buildings, including commissioning, oper operation and maintenance. The timeline to develop this standard is six months. Uh, and I believe that it, it commenced in the beginning of the year. Um, and I, I kind of think to myself, well, don't hold my breath. Like six months is very tight. And, and what can we be doing until this new standards release? Um, but it, it is being developed on the tail end of a Lancet, Lancet Commission publication. Um, it's the, the, the publication is proposed, proposed non-infectious air delivery rates. So I really like the title. You know, it's non-infectious air delivery rates. So it's not outdoor rates or clean air rates. It's non-infectious air delivery rates for reducing um, exposure to airborne respiratory infection disease and infectious diseases. That's what the document looks like. Um, and what they and, and the, the fellow that leads the um, the task group, the working group, is is Joe Joe Allen, um, who who some of you will know of. Um, uh, we've actually featured Joseph Allen through Workplace Health Without Borders on one of our webinars. But this seems to be a perfect guide moving forward to, to figure out what the, um, the, effect, the air, changes, air, air changes per hour, the effective air changes per hour should be, um, you know, based on occupants in the area as well. So in Canada, uh, the, the, the government of Canada, so, so, so basically in Canada, we do um, have the general duty clause. And we do refer to you know having good indoor air quality, and we do refer to to ASHRAE. Um, and there's just been a um, 
bits of guidance, draft guidance material from, from released from the from the, the government of Canada. Uh, it's around reducing airborne infectious aerosol exposure. And I, so I'm part of the uh, Canadian Aerosol Transmission Coalition, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but we're kind of closely aligned with the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. So they've actually provided a submission to the government on, on this document. So in Ontario, um, uh, looking at the occupational health clinics for Ontario workers, uh, we have a checklist, uh, pandemic-based guide to maintaining your building ventilation system. And I just want to um, like acknowledge my colleague, John Udick, who does an amazing amount of work. And he's he's actually got an online ventilation calculation tool, or he's built it for OCAL, and it's on, 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 on our website. And that's just the, so John did actually provide a, a presentation through Workplace Health Without Borders. Um, uh, and Workplace Health Without Borders is an international organization and we're all volunteers. Um, and we do similar work, but more of an international uh, way to, to share the information. And I also want to acknowledge um, Alec Farquhar, who's done an amazing job with the Canadian Aerosol Transmission Coalition. And you'll find there's a lot of guidance material um, and, you know, thinking about moving forward uh, and just relating back to a presentation from Professor Rainer McIntyre the other day, a lot of the changes is really going to have to come from grassroots organizations such as, as uh, you know, the uh, Canadian Aerosol Transmission Co Coalition, Workplace Health Without Borders, and also the World Health Network that we're, we're kind of aligned with as well. Um, and... I, some of you will know that there's, there was a bill recently introduced into, into the Legislative Assembly here on March the 27th, uh, calling for uh, having it's a clean air bill, basically. Um, and I just want to you know, say that the, the, the fellow that's behind a lot of this, who is also leads the task group from the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, Joey Fox, he's, 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 a, he's a fabulous list leader. And he's really been doing some great advocacy as well. Um, so, you know, if, if you think about the um, Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, they have some really good guidance material there. On the left hand side, you can go and have a look at it yourself. And when I actually um, did talk to Joey Fox at a OCARE webinar, <laughs> um, we had a, there was a cartoonist on the wings and like she was listening in, she kind of quickly put this together. So, you know, what, what can individuals do? Um, ensure the thermoset is set properly so you, you provide, have it on, not auto, so you, you provide more outside air. Um, and ventilate, make sure you, you, your room air is ventilated all the time when it's occupied. M uh, maximize the amount of air, outdoor air coming in. Um, you can buy a reasonable price CO2 monitors that you can carry around with you. Um, it tells you how much. Uh, air that you're breathing in from others because people, other people breathe out CO2, but there could be other extraneous sources too. So I guess beware, just understand what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's also about making sure that the, all the airflows are working, the, the, the registers aren't blocked, the, the supplier returns aren't blocked. Definitely um, looking at portable HIPAA filters, avoiding ionization, plasma oxidation. Um, opening the windows, you can exhaust air with a fan. And we, we've already talked about the Corsi Rosenthal box. Um, so the, the, the box on the right hand side is one that I actually made uh, myself for my son's school. And I was lucky enough, the principal was grateful enough to accept it and put it in my, my son's classroom. But this was kind of a long time ago. Through the network, um, uh, there's, there's a fellow called Ryan Otto, who's uh, Sarah Adelman's partner, who, you know, just gave me some basic instructions about how to build this. And, you know, it's quite, they're quite easy to build. If you can ride a bicycle, <laughs> you can build one of these. Um, you, you do it once and it becomes second nature. It's really just, you know, putting a box together with duct tape and then putting a fan on the top of the bo box. And so anyway, the, you, you'll see on the right hand side, I've provide, th provided three hyperlinks there. Um, which which kind of give you some instructions, and I, I see Dorothy Wigmore has also provided instructions in the chat box as well. And the very bottom hyperlink, how to build a Corsi Rosenthal box, 
Um, that's actually uh, being produced by Richard Corsi. So he's one of the, the two people that invented this, uh, this, this, this air, do it yourself air purifier. You can go to Canadian Tire, Walmart, Home Depot, and, and you can buy the, uh, buy it yourself and save a lot of money, you know, with a, compared to an expensive, um, air purifier. This is, this is quite cost effective. And I'm really not sure how I went for time. I kind of blew through those slides. I just wanted to provide an overview and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I think uh, Kim is going to moderate. Uh, no, Cheryl Baker. Oh, Cheryl. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Kevin. And yes, we have a question in the chat. Also, remember, you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, so Hector is asking, where can workers get affordable CO2 monitors? Um, the library offers some, but they are always booked. Hmm. Um, I did buy a, a cheaper CO2 monitor online. And to tell you the truth, I can I'd have to go back and, and, and find out where I got it from. I have two. I have um, the Aronet, which is mm -hmm. kind of the, the Rolls Royce type. Um, this is actually synced to my to my to my phone, so I can actually, you know, it's very handy. For example, when I'm oh, can't really see that keeps disappearing. Uh, when I um, I fly, for example, you know, it, if if I'm on the tarmac before the plane takes off, you'll see really really high carbon dioxide levels. Uh, because the ventilation hasn't really kicked in when you're on the tarmac. And the same on the other end, you know, if you, you, you're on the tarmac waiting to get off, it, it, it peaks as well quite high. So it really shows how important it is that a wearer, a, a, a respirator, not a, one of those baggy blue surgical masks, but a proper respirator in those, in those situations. I do have, um, I do have uh, links somewhere but I'd have to go back and search, but they are available. Um, but what you want to do is, even if you buy a cheaper one, look for an NDIR, a non-dispersive infrared uh, detector, because they have a better, um, you know, error. The, the, the error is not as great. Um, I think this is like plus or minus 30 ppm, and the other one that I have is plus or minus 50 ppm. But they are, they, you just got to go looking for search on, online, um, but there are cheaper ones available. I think I paid about $40 for this one. And if anybody, I can put my um, email address in the chat box, if it's enabled, because it sort of looked like it wasn't enabled before, but if I can do it to everybody, and then um, maybe if anybody has any questions like that, I can go back and find out where I bought it online. Okay, thanks. See, Kimberly's got a hand up. Thanks, Kevin. I went ahead and uh, put my address as well, so um, directly to Hector, but if anyone else is interested, we can share that information maybe on our website so people can have a peek over there. Um, so yes, Kimberly is the, has her hand up. If you go ahead, Kimberly. Sure, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, uh, great presentation. And again, just um, Kim Minette uh, on our LAC who introduced you was really, um, you know, interested in this subject matter and we were brainstorming and brainstorming. So I just wanted to tell folks um, to stay tuned because we'd like to offer other sessions, particularly on um, indoor air quality in general. And, and the question started to Kevin and I might know the answer, uh, but it, it was, um, you know, at OCAL, we've really taken, tried to take what we've learned from COVID to you know, healthy indoor environments, even without any pandemics. Um, why shouldn't we have clean air um, in our indoor air quality environments? Um, you know, when all this and is is through, um, and in preparation for the next inevitable. Um, and so, yeah, Kevin, I just thought you might talk to some of the work that we've done. <laughs> Um, because, and, and we're gonna, we're gonna tap into this um, in the future just for folks, uh, because Kim at the Workers' Health and Safety Center and ourselves at OCAL would like to partner um, and really get some, you know, some great indoor air quality, um, improved knowledge that we've learned through the pandemic um, to folks. Um, so Kevin, kind of a statement question, if you wanna speak to that. 
Yeah, it's not just about COVID. It's about future pandemics. Yeah. Um, and and it, for example, if you think about TB, you know, TB, um, it's evading vaccines more so now. And you think about TB in, um, you know, indigenous groups. And uh, you think also about um, influenza, other airborne transmissible diseases. So it's really, it's good practice, you know, just to be prepared and to improve our area. It really needs a lot more attention. Um, and if you think about um, in school situations and university situations, um, you know, we really need to lower the level of carbon dioxide. So, you know, if we're exposed to higher levels of carbon dioxide, it makes us tired um, and we don't perform as well. And there's a lot of attention in that area as well. Um, and, and also, you know, I, I, it, I mean, it's probably relevant to certain parts of Canada. And also, you know, my, in Australia, my dad um, had lung cancer. And his breathing became really difficult, you know, towards the end, he couldn't breathe. And where we lived, we had a lot of bushfires. So, that, you know, the parts he threw in the air and, and he, he kind of, it would really affect his, his breathing. Um, uh, we have an air purifier in our bedroom um, and my, my partner and I, we suffer, both suffer from a little bit of asthma. But funny, you know, it doesn't seem to, it's almost like having cleaner air doesn't, affect us as much that way so there's lots of good reasons for doing this it's just good practice anyway thanks hope that covers it hi thank you um i don't see any other questions in the chat um so i'm just going through Leonor mentioned there are air cleaners sold commercially in very accessible cost, a bit over 100. Are those reliable? Um, so there are ways that you can um, check the reliability. And there is a group in the US, um, like in a manufacturer's association that, you know, that lists all of the, the air purifiers and um, you know, if, if you're kind of looking for an air purifier, you know, I, I, I kind of went out and I got the parts to make a Corsi Rosenthal box. Like, would I spend $1,000 on an air purifier where I could build one myself that could do exactly the same job or better? Um, and they are, you know, there's been a lot of work looking at these safety of Corsi Rosenthal boxes. But, you know, maybe you could also uh, look at... Um, other kinds of air purifiers. There is, um, so Joey Fox did actually talk about an organization in the US. So if you have a look at my presentation, you'll see that organization. I can go back and see if I can find it and put it in the chat box, if you like. It's, it's, a, it's a manufacturer's association. I don't know, if Dorothy, if anybody else wants to chime in there and, and tell, tell the audience who it is. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm just going to read in the chat. I'm not sure if everybody's able to pop back and forth. So Hector says, boy, it would be cool if workers organizations could make the CR boxes at low cost and sell them to concerned folks for a little profit. Maybe that's an opportunity there. Um, yes, for sure. And also Sioux Street, uh, can you recommend the ideal N95 versus fit tested respirators? And how do we ensure the best fit for a variety of cases if we don't have access to fit testing? Uh, so the Canadian Aerosol Transmission Coalition, um, like I said, I just acknowledge Alec Farquhar because he's really been great in that, like bringing us all together and leading that group along with Stefan Bellidou. We actually have on, the, on our website, Mask Smart 1, Mask Smart 2, Mask Smart 3. Um, so we do provide, you know, basic training for the public, and then it, it progresses to, more to workers. And we have Dr. Simon Smith, I think, on the on the call as well, that was part of that group doing that work, and he's a big part of the coalition. Um, you're better off to, you know, having a face, have a, having a fit tested respirator with a quantitative fit test is the gold. It's the gold standard. It's the best by far if you have access to that. But if you follow some clear instructions about how to do a seal check with your hands and, and fit it properly to your face. It will provide much better protection than, say, a, a surgical mask or another kind of face cover. 
Um, but yeah, if you have a look at the coalition website and watch Mass Maps one, two, and three, you can get some some basic instructions. I've actually got my son in the first one. Um, he's doing judo with a, a respirator on, um, and it seems to he seems to be quite comfortable with it. Uh, the problem is, you know, they've dropped restrictions now, so we're really up against, you know, everything to try and reinforce restrictions. There's some people that will refuse not to to wear a mask in an airplane or down a hospital. So we're kind of, you know, the, the pandemic hasn't gone away and we don't want to get reinfected a second or a third time um, because our, the risk of ill health effects are going to be so much greater. So, you know, we really need to think about cleaning the air now. Um, so that's it. I'll go and see if I can find that, um, the link to that site and I'll provide it in the chat box to that organization that, you know, that, that lists all of the air handling units. That, oh, sorry, the air purifiers that, that I was talking about. Thanks, Kevin. And as Jennifer has reminded everybody in the chat, we are also going to share the presentations on the uh, OCAL website as well as the Ottawa Labor Council.org or Ottawa Labor.org as well. So um, they will be able to get those links there. Does anybody else have any questions for Kevin? No hands up. I hope I've seen all of the chat uh, comments and questions, I think. And if nobody's put their hand up, then hopefully I haven't missed them. Okay, thanks. Thanks for being given this opportunity, everyone. Thanks very much, Kevin. Bye. There might be some questions later on right, in a, a panel situation as a group, or we're of just about finished. Yep, yeah. okay. They can find us too at ocow.on.ca. Our email addresses are there and phone numbers to reach out to us. So I can put them in the chat as we go along. Um, we're way ahead of schedule. That doesn't happen. 10 minutes is a long time when we're talking about this. So um, I believe Sean will be going first for closing remarks if everybody's ready for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so thank you, Cheryl. And You're muted, Sean. Um, um, so thank you, Cheryl. And again, uh, as I indicated earlier on, as I mentioned, thank you to, uh, to the presenters. Um, thank you to all the participants today. I think it's been very informative. Uh, I know some folks pop in to hear just specific presentations, and that's cool. That's sort of the way that this uh, Spring in Action event is designed. Those that uh, participated right through it, uh, good on you, uh, and we sure do appreciate that. Uh, again, to uh, to Terry, to uh, to the elder that opened with the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm just going to give a bit of a plug for the uh, day of mourning that's coming up in communities across the country. Uh, in another two weeks. So as uh, those on the on the call uh, do know, uh, April 28th is uh, is a day of mourning for workers killed or injured on the job. Uh, the Canadian Labor Congress, uh, CanadianLabor.ca, has um, um, a number of locations there where events or ceremonies will be held. In Ottawa, we've done hours at, at Vincent Massey Park. So I know there are some on the call that have attended Vincent Massey Park in the past, we normally get about 500 people out, um, sort of ties in directly to what we're talking about and if there are protections and if we pay uh, particular attention and ensure that employers pay attention, um, the idea is that those uh, on average thousand workers uh, a year who uh, who die as a direct result of the workplace will be uh, will be cut down. And to some of us, hopefully they'll uh, that amount will will be zero, very close to zero. Um, ours event in Ottawa again is at Vincent Massey Park, and it's at Vincent Massey Park because of its proximity to the Heron Road Bridge. Uh, the Heron Road Bridge uh, collapsed and on August 10th, 1966, uh, taking with it nine workers uh, were killed, um, eight workers that day, and then a worker, another worker a couple days uh, later. Uh, there's two different plaques there at, at at the Heron Road Bridge site, uh, one on a big boulder um, that lists the names of those nine individuals who did uh, who were killed. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, the Labor Council 
uh, promoted uh, with our city councilors and with the mayor. We did quite a bit of work uh, to have the Heron Road Bridge uh, renamed the Heron Road uh, Workers Memorial Bridge um, and another plaque. So there's actually three monuments there, two plaques right at the bridge and then a monument to all workers across the country that the CLC um, um, had uh, dedicated, erected at uh, right at Vincent Massey Park. So um, did, there's different times. It's not necessarily 11 o'clock. Uh, hours is held at 1230, uh, runs about an hour. So those that are in Ottawa certainly encourage um, uh, you to participate in the event, in the ceremony. Um, most of the events are now moving towards um, in person, which I think is great. Uh, we did, because of the pandemic, have to do at least one, and maybe it was two years, I just can't remember, um, the an Ottawa event virtually. Um, it was a little more complicated, but we're able to pull it off. But again, now that things are uh, appearing um, closer to, to, to normal, uh, those are being held in person. I think it's great. Um, those that aren't in Ottawa, for sure, uh, Southern Ontario, uh, Toronto, there's a number of different events that are taking place. And again, highly uh, encourage folks to, uh, to to pop out. It's important. It's important that uh, we continue to, to mourn for our dad and to fight for the living. And I think part of what today was about was that, was to fight for the living. So again, uh, with thanks to, uh, to all of those that participated today. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, I would like, just like to uh, uh, also say thank you to everyone who's participated, including the participants. Uh, the more uh, knowledge that people gain, the more they will share with others, particularly in the workplace, which is critically important. Uh, I also invite you to please fill, fill out those uh, feedback forms. Again, it's very important for us to uh, be able to know how to plan for our next event uh, next year, uh, picking uh, topics that are relevant uh, for you in the workplace um, is, is essential. So uh, please make sure that you fill out those forms and we look forward to uh, seeing you next year. Uh, and uh, if there is anything that uh, OCAL or the ODLC or your local labor council can do to help support you with health and safety in your workplace, please reach out to them. Uh, Kimberly? You're on mute, Kimberly. Well, we certainly got the spring in this spring into action event. Um, and we're giving you a bit of that day back um, to enjoy some of that um, sun, which rises in the east, by the way. And uh, all of these funny puns um, now call you to action. So I, you know, um, really hope that the what we've presented um, uh, helps um, and that you can, you know, we need your help um, uh, taking action, spreading the word, spreading the knowledge, mobilizing the knowledge, um, and maybe helping us with the, growing the programs with the temporary and migrant farm workers in the East with any connections that you have. And, and truly what a showcase of the amazing team we have to work with. Laura gets this thing going uh, with Sean. Um, I just can't thank them enough. She, you know, she'll, she's already planning uh, her and Sean next year. Uh, and we choose this time very carefully. We really chose the spring um, timing to promote the day of mourning ceremonies that Sean was speaking about um, he, in Ottawa and around um, our Eastern Ontario region and across the province. Um, in addition to, um, you know, the Steps for Life and, and that supports Threads for Life happening in May and Health and Safety Week in May, we sort of like to inspire everyone to get um, energized um, and full of knowledge before those really significant uh, memorial and action-oriented events around health and safety. So I, I cannot thank the LACs and the Ottawa District Labor Council who has partnered with us on this event which is growing and growing. Um, and Laura and all the LAC members that were uh, mentioned, Paul, Kim, uh, I, I, Aaron, I, I, I won't have them all in front of me now because Laura did this at the beginning. Cheryl Baker and Jennifer Moore, 
um, who really uh, behind the scenes are doing it all, right? So thanks to Jennifer Moore with the Auto District Labor Council and, and Cheryl as well. Um, and I, I hope everyone has a blessed uh, sunny spring day and that you take action. David, you're still here. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the speakers and the LAC members, pop on, say hi. Um, and yeah, just get out there and in the name of health and safety, taking your, your action from our day. Thanks everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon. One last time, a plug for the feedback form. Yeah, thanks, Laura. <laughs>